And we're live. Hey guys, welcome to Whiskey Charlie, the War Game Chat, our monthly show on YouTube. I'm your host, Mo from Mo's Game Table, and joining me is my co-host tonight. Kev is not here, so we're just going to have me and Gimp, everyone's favorite Gimp at the Limp, the Gimpy Gamer, Nate Rogers. How's it going, Nate? It's another glorious day in the core. Nice to see a couple of, uh, of honorable guests here with us this evening. Nice to have them. Yes. We have two awesome people here. We have Mark Walker and we have Herman Lutman. Everybody knows both of these guys. They've been on the show before and they're awesome designers, great guys, and we love having them on. And uh, been trying to get them on for a couple months to talk about rules and learning games and stuff like that. But uh, we'll get to that soon enough. Thanks, Thanks for having, having us. Going, guys. How's it going? Great. Love your intro music, man. Yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good to be here. Good to see y'all. Yeah, it's great to see you too. And uh, you know, before we go any further, we got what uh, less than twenty four hours to go on the eighty five Kickstarter. That's uh, your background there, right, Mark? Yes, we do. It's got almost thirty five thousand. We'll see what we do in the last twenty four hours. Nice. Might see a few more thousand, get a few more stretch goals knocked out. I'm excited about it. Let's see here. I'm going to add that in. For those who don't already know, definitely go to that link, check it out. And uh, if you've played 65, you will be familiar with the system. And it's going to have its own, you know, its own personality and some things that are going to be done differently. Uh, yeah. But if you've played 65, you have a good feel for how the game's going to go. And if you've not watched it, we did a playthrough or a partial playthrough. Uh, on the channel, so that'll and also be a good cool. time doing that. Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of fun. That's a lot That's of fun. fun. It's good. I'm looking forward to it. I can't wait to to have that one and uh, play because you can play two player or you can play or even three or four if you wanted to edit more people and split things up. But you can also play solitaire because you can have the alone in the mountains uh, solitaire expansion as well. Correct? Yep, absolutely. Been working on that all day, pretty much. So yeah, I'm looking forward to it. One of the nice things about designing solitaire games is you can test them yourself. That's <laughs> true. This is true. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes one, the test, yep, which is good. It only takes one. The system works Plus, well. Plus, they're easier to get play testers for. Yeah. What were you saying, Her? I said the, the solo system works well in 65, too. I assume yes. it's a similar system, right? Alone it, in the jungle. Yeah, it's the same system. Refined. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Don't so, so, <laughs> asleep, Mark. I that was who I texted Mark earlier. I'm like, hey, uh, you want to come on the show tonight? You know, because he didn't respond to my email. I know you were right, right. Like, I know. See, bring it out. And then you're like, sure, I'll come on. And then you're like, what time? And I'm like, oh man, it's Mark past his. <laughs> <laughs> I told I told Jester that when we get together for gaming, when it gets to about eight thirty nine o'clock, Mark's Mark's got that look in his face, like, okay, I've had enough now. Yeah, I do sometimes. I really yeah. do. But I was upstairs watching the uh, championship game in the World Baseball Classic, actually. USA's up one nothing uh -huh. to a Trey Turner home run. Trey nice. Turner, who will be the Philly shortstop. Yeah. Did you yeah. see the end of the Jap uh, the Japan uh, Mexico game? That was quite exciting. Yeah. I did. I did. I saw the replay. I didn't see it live, but right. I saw the replay. Right. People were yeah. saying, that. now I want to see it because they had like it in, in, in English. And they said, now I want to see it done by the Japanese announcer. So somebody yeah. says, you ask yeah. and here you go. And they did the Japanese one. It was even better. <laughs> oh, I bet that was amazing. No, I didn't it was see great. that. I bet that was yeah. Amazing. yeah, it was pretty fun. Yeah, what was well, that movie? Also amazing was that pinch runner they put in. Uh, almost caught Shohei Otani before Otani got yep. home. Yeah. I mean, he was like right he on was his flying. heels. Yep. Oh, is it 1-1? One, one? Okay, cool. Uh, and Otani is is not slow by any means. So anyway, back to board game. I yeah. can't believe you guys all watch baseball. It's just like mind-numbingly uh, boring to me. Nah, uh, it's <laughs> yeah. inside it's baseball. Once you understand all the little intricacies, it's fascinating. No, it's it would be better if they could carry the bat for the uh, for the duration, right around the bases. That way, as they're trying to make it, if someone's guarding a base. Mark somebody. Yeah. yeah. You just take them out. Exactly. They let them do it in hockey. Yeah. Yeah. Hockey's a little different though. You're allowed to go. I mean, hockey's the only sport where you have guys 200, 200, between 200 and 250 pounds traveling around at about 30, 35 miles an hour yeah. on steak blades with clubs in their hand yeah. and no teeth. <laughs> <laughs> I've, always, I've always said the greatest sport to see live is hockey. It's totally it is. different. 
It's just so different. You hear them banging into the boards and hitting each other and the skates. It's just amazing. Yeah, but it's yeah. it's visceral. Yep, it but is. Yep. I went to some, um, who was it, the Hurricanes, North Carolina mm-hmm. Hurricanes. Yeah. Uh, went to their games back in the day. I used to like uh, do uh, concessions or something like that back when I was in high school. And I had a lot of fun going to those games. That was just yeah. you know cool to hang out, even though I'm not yeah. a big hockey fan. But you're right. You can hear the the smash, you know, hey, wherever Fabrizio. you are. Hey, Fabrizio. Fabrizio's hey, in the house. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other thing that's cool, too, is if you get a chance to check out any of the regional leagues like the ECHL, American Hockey League or um, the SPHL or anything, get down ice level if you can. Be near the benches and just listen to the chirps that the that the players are throwing okay. at each other. It's hilarious. It's just we have a team stuff. called the Ice Bears in Knoxville, and it's sold out all the time. And that's exactly nice. what you hear. Everything. It's great. <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. And nothing beats it. But uh, so, what have you been up to, Herm? I know uh, Mark's been working on uh, eighty five here with the Kickstarter uh, and all. So, what are you up to? Zombie it's games. Been, it's been crazy, I have to say. I was actually working on four different games yesterday and, and a little bit today. So it's been it's been quite busy. Any that um, you can talk about, or are they all secret projects right now? Uh, no. Well, for people who've been waiting, let's see. I actually looked this up on Board Game Geek. Miracle at Dunkirk. My first Board Game Geek entry was in 2015 for that game. So I finally heard from Randy at Legion. Uh, they got a, uh, they hired Don Herndon to be the developer. So this thing's going to actually happen now. So, oh wow, nice. Yeah. So we're finally getting Edmund uh, Hudson did the map, and we're just going through the rules and the cards and everything now. So hopefully it'll come out fairly soon. Congratulations. Hope that goes well for you. What's yeah, the turnaround? It's been a long, long time. What's the turnaround with them once they get once you get a developer? I don't know. This is the first game I've done with them. Okay. Yeah. Because it seems like they're a little, you know, slower than other uh, other publishers for whatever reason, whether it's a lack of developers or, you know, they're trying to match people up I, and things I, like I that. I think it's a little bit of Randy was trying to do everything himself. And, and that too. <laughs> yeah. I can think that's of tough. one that's slower. Just and the Plum Island Horror is, oh my God. You talk about a lot of work. <laughs> and, well, we'll talk about this later in the rules section, but I had to go through the rules reference book and basically we did a glossary and I had to go through all my rules and copy and paste everything, you know, all the details into the glossary and oh my lord. Mm. That was a lot of work. But that game is that game's come on along nicely. I think people are gonna like it. Is it gonna have an index too or just a glossary? As an index too, yeah. Oh wow. Because I was gonna say that's double the beating then. Index and a glossary. Yeah. <laughs> People don't realize how tough that is. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh damn! Um, I haven't seen that one. I'm I'm eyeballing it right now while you were talking about it. It actually looks pretty good. Mm-hmm. I have to say, I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised the artwork that GMT put together for that. I was afraid it was going to look really wargamey, of course. You know, I mean, it's a horror multiplayer horror game, and Terry uh, Leeds did the artwork on it. And I think he did. He just nailed it. Okay, now I've got to go look at it. Yeah, it, <laughs> Mo, can you pull it up? Fifties, fifties comic book uh, vibe here. Let's, yeah, it uh, does. Yeah, it, it's kind of a pulp fictiony thing. Pulp yeah. fiction. That's it exactly. Yeah. You know, which is very, very cool about that having that. Um, well, I mean, this goes back to I mean, and Mark can attest to this. When you get together, we play a lot of uh, multiplayer horror, fantasy, dungeon crawly type stuff. I mean, I know Nate plays some of those too, right? So do you. Yep. And. I, w- I always wanted to design one, and that's basically my attempt at it. Um, Gene Billingsley from GMT was always a fan of Dawn of the Zits, all the way back to, God, when I first met him at uh, Consum World Expo in Tempe. He, you know, he wanted me to do something like that. That was like 10 years ago. Um, so this is the first opportunity I've really had to do that. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be fun. And thank God, uh, custom here. dice, man. I get so right. like I get tired of D sixes, right? Because so yeah. many games use uh, D sixes or two D six or three D six or you know whatever. Mm-hmm. And it's just nice to see anything that's different. That's always one of the things I always criticize. 
is that uh, it's always a D6. And I get it because for for publishers, that's probably the, the cheapest die you can go with, right? And no. everybody's used to it. It no. fits everything. No. Really? A D6? It doesn't matter is... at all. doesn't matter at all. Really? It's got nothing to do with cost. What is nothing. it? Is it just game design? It, the design needs to have polyhedral die, and then, you know, we use them. But, no, there's no difference in cost. Yeah. Hmm. Or at least no appreciable difference. Wow. With looking better the other way, so I'm going to leave it that way. But that yeah. right there is the... That's a beautiful cover. Cover. And that looks just really kick-ass. I'm just... It, the I, best I, part I, about I it is... the hole in the fence. <laughs> yeah. And the 10 cents up top. I think that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> that's, a cheap, that's a cheap price for a game there. I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, a, that's a quarter of a penny commission for me. <laughs> so you got the pull up, uh, uh, pull up the pull counters, Mo. Show the counters. Pull, uh, show the counters. That's where I was looking for here. Where, where yeah, go on down. I don't think they put it on down. this page. I don't think they updated the counters. These are old. Oh, counters. there you go. Uh, those are old counters. You need to go to BGG. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they never this. update this page, which is interesting. So it's still going to be well, the standees. They, it's still standees, sure, they but they're, like your, they're taller. They have, your, they have your interview with Rod. I mean, that's fairly recent, right? Yep. Biff that's Rogers. That's a good-looking counter there. I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, it it, it, yeah. Herm, is it going to be a standy? I saw yeah. it standing up. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. nice. So the main, the main units and the main baddies are going to be on standees. Okay. Nice. But I love that. You have Biff Rogers. Do you have a chat <laughs> yeah. in there too or a chip or anything like that? There's well, there is a you're in the game, I can tell you that. Oh, nice. There's a Moe's game store. Nice. <laughs> That's awesome. And there's uh Nate's was um oh my god, Nate's in there. Kev is in there. I know Kev is uh Sharp's rifle company. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <what the? laughs> Walker awesome. family. Um, and Nate, I think you have a clothing store, Nate. Sweet. Lingerie <laughs> store. Awesome. That, that's going to be so cool. Yeah, so we're definitely looking forward to that for sure. And, uh, you know, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Your games always are. And uh, it, one of the things I've always loved about when you do horror, you do horror and it can be a little scary, but it's also tongue in cheek as well. It's not just straight up. Yes, yeah. scary, which is uh, it makes it more family friendly, which is really cool. Yeah, I did the same thing with Dawn of the Zeds. It was all tongue in cheek. And I mm -hmm. I just want when people play those kind of games, I don't really want them to be afraid. Right. Or or uh, grossed out or anything like that. It's mostly I like bad B movie, you know, horror movies, um, mystery science theater, 3000 type of movies. And so when I do these kind of games, everything, everything's tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. I hope you'll laugh at some of the cards. All the references, all the names are either people I know or they're pop culture references or there's there's a few references of TV shows that I love, like F Troop. <laughs> and the nice. <laughs> nice. Well, that has yeah, added... Yeah, uh, with the Sergeant O'Rourke and a Corporal Agarn. And, yeah. That's the, the awesome. added benefit that I could pull that game out in front of my kids and I'm not going to, yeah. you know, worry about them seeing whatever's on it, right? Mm -hmm. I could let them play it with me. My... My oldest is eight, you know, right. and he'd be perfectly fine playing that with me. Yeah. And yeah, we had, I mean, you had the same kind of vibe in, uh, in Invaders and yep. uh, Colossi, or as Grant says, Colossi. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, it's the same thing. Nate, to go back to the die and the dice real quick, mm -hmm. stamped. Dice are what cost a lot. What's a stamped okay, so dice? It could be a D six, but if each die, I'm I'm rolling die. You know, if each if each die has a different face on it, like a star, like what we did in uh, uh, in Armageddon War. Armageddon War, yeah, yeah. Die, they, those cost significantly more. Like See, when we uh, do these deluxe die for the, uh, uh, we did them for the second edition of uh, Fearful Sacrifice. Did he? Deluxe die costs more. Right. So, yeah. No, I get that there was a hey, are gonna cost more. <laughs> Tony's bored like. It was based on the attack of the fifty foot woman, actually. Mm-hmm. Herbertio is jumping right into the meat of the subject here. My rule of thumb for rules, if the 
version number is lower than 20, you must check them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we'll never tell you what version it is. <laughs> exactly. It's version one, as far as you know. <laughs> But right. yeah, Tales from the Crypt, you know, that was another great one. And uh, yeah, that's, uh, we got Manders joining us as well. Thanks for hey. joining us tonight. Tony, how's it going? Yeah. And uh, Wardrobe. Uh, so wardrobe. what else, anything else you have to uh, talk about as far as games you got? Because you, you said you're working on four. Can you gave us a couple uh, that you uh, give? One of them I can't talk about. I just finished by Iron and Blood for White Dog Games. That's on the Battle of Koningsgratz. Um, just, I, I love that period of European history. I don't know. I, you know, I'll keep pumping those out as long as I can. Um, Mark and I talked about our next, um, after Crowbar, um, I think we're going to do the Muse Argon Offensive Ooh. with Pershing and World War I. So that's, uh, we're looking forward to doing that. We had to do something with Americans in it. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Absolutely. Yeah. That should yeah. be fun. Yeah. Definitely be fun. So the topic that we had, um, you know, it's funny because now rules are, are have become kind of a hot topic here uh, recently with regards to war games. Originally, I think it was back in November, December, we had talked about getting together and talking about how um, rules learning as far as learning multiple rules for different games, as far as like content creators and designers and, and publishers and how you're constantly having to play different games and how do you keep them all straight in your head? Newsflash, we really don't. Uh, not that well mm -hmm. all the time. Um, yep. But uh, it, how do you do it compared to like some people who play like one game exclusively for an extended period of time, uh, especially when you're trying to, get games out quickly, whether it's as a publisher, designer, or content creator. And that, and then now the, the hot topic, so we can kind of cover both. The other hot topic now is um, more, uh, pe some people are saying that war game rules are uh, not written well. They don't like the case system and, you know, they think they could be better. And I, I think they're, that's a whole different discussion, but we can add that into this as well because mm -hmm. I think for some games, the, the conversational tone could work, but it'd have to be pretty short rules. Um, or you can have a modified case system where you just have like rule 1.0, 1.1, 1.2, and then go to 2.0. You know, you don't have like 12.1, 2.1, you know, stuff like that where right. you're really drilling down. Uh, but as far as like learning rules, we'll start with you, Mark. As a publisher, when you get a game sent to you from a designer, uh, how does it how hard is it for you to learn a game and then decide right away? Obviously, I mean, I know you can, how you can make the decision if it's going to be a game you want to publish or not, but how do you keep games in your head that, you know, you're just playing something last night, maybe at your little convention here with, with Herm, and then tomorrow he's got, Hey, I got a game for you. I want you to play. Here's the rules. And you know, how do you, how are you able to separate everything in your head? Uh, I can't. I know he's <laughs> Okay, okay simple answer. Yeah, <laughs> but but a, a couple of points about that I'll tell you that are interesting. One of the things that uh, that fascinates me is not necessarily to do with publishing, although it's part of it, is how how we learn rules. Okay, because uh, not only do I love games, uh, if you look on Kickstarter, just for example. Uh, we've we've run maybe 14 or 15 Kickstarters. I lose track. I personally backed something like 140 or 50 uh, because I love games and I buy other games too. Uh, I consider games my professional reading, but even if I didn't, I just love to play them. They're a good break. And so one of the things, but I don't have a lot of time, probably just like the three of you guys, Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have a lot of time. So I am constantly searching for a way to learn games quicker. That's that. That's what I want to do. I want to get a game on the table and get to the point where I'm having fun. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I've got a couple of, uh, of quick things I'll throw out on that, and then I'll get back to the publisher thing. But thing number one is uh, I look for YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that's why as a just an aside to 
to content creators, I believe that playthrough videos are more uh, valuable and get more hits probably than reviews. People are not afraid to make up their own mind about a game. They just want to see a thing play. That's one way I learned how to play it. The other way is, is I just don't read the rules. And I, I think we all joked and laughed about that. And, and, and we kind of agreed when we briefly did. I mean, I, I can take the rules to a reasonably complex game. Let, let, let's say 25 pages. Read them. Stem to turn, break out the game, go to move the first piece, and open the rule book. Because I don't remember what I need to do. So after doing that all the time, I just got to, you know, why read them? Just skim through the rules, look for, especially if there's a real good uh, sequence of play, you get everything out, and you just start going by the sequence of play. I find I learn quickly that way. Let me say it's a quick aside, and then I'll shut up. Uh, as far as reading rules and telling if I want to get a game, I don't really do that. It's if Herm says, let's do this, I say, fine, let's do it. I, I don't have to read Herm's rules. Okay. Well, yeah, he's a known commodity, but I'm talking about like, you know, uh, well, any, I don't take else unknown out. commodities, not for Flying Pig. If Greg mm -hmm. Porter, who is, you know, mm -hmm. I test with Greg every week. He has a, an impeccable reputation as a role-playing game designer, and he did a great job of getting more. If Herm comes, I mean, if Greg comes to me right now, we're working on the sequel to uh, Armageddon War. It's called Rising Dragon. Hopefully, we won't go to nice. war with China and ruin that. But uh, <laughs> and uh, Greg doesn't have to show me his rules yet. I know it's going to be great. Same thing with Shane. You know, in the old yeah. school tactical system. You know, if he wants to do, we're working on the uh, the fourth, the fourth one in that, which is the Mediterranean. That's fine. I'll, I'll do it. And um, so did I miss anything or did I just talk myself out? No. I, <laughs> I, I thought you were sort of falling. You know, one, one thing that you hit on, I think, is a real key point. And that really, there's two things. Number one is um, player aids. A good player aid is a mm -hmm. real gigantic Definitely. key to the puzzle right there of learning. Yeah, absolutely. If you have a good player aid, you could essentially, especially after you, you know, the more you get familiar with the game, it's not going to happen immediately in game one, but with a good player aid, you never hit, have to hit the rule book. Everything should be right there in the player aid. Mm -hmm. And if you need to, um, you can just say, oh, who exactly does this first? Here, let me hit that rule. Oh, yeah, it's those guys. Or you can even yeah. make a little note to yourself. Right. And that also, player aids are also a great case for the case system because you don't have to go yeah. page 12 because you go to page 12 and you're like, where on page 12 is it? Oh, it's here. Oh, wait, I got to read the other half page before and then I got to read the page after for it to all make sense. Whereas you can go to the case system, you can read just that case. So I, uh, I've, I've never understood, like Herm was saying, I know that we both play the vast majority of our gaming are not war games. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, and I know you both don't play war games exclusively. All right, so I've seen I, I've seen what Fantasy Flight does. I've seen what Simon does, uh, and they do a great job. And neither one of them use the case system. And when I pull out a war game and read the rules with the case system, to me, I don't understand what the problem is with the case system. All it is, I mean, if you're talking like, uh, up, you know, you're saying. When a unit moves, you can use opportunity fire, uh, parenthesis 12.1.1, end of parenthesis. All it does is save you time. You go to 12.1.1, and there's opportunity fire. The way Fantasy Flight would do it, God love them, is they would say page seven, mm -hmm. and you go to page seven, and like you said, read a little bit before, read the whole page, just to find out that it's in their special terms rule book that they've given you, and then you have to look up opportunity fire. I, I don't see a problem with uh, cases. Well, the case system too, I call it, I have another little nickname for it because I know a lot of people love to use this term. And we'll say a game, a rule book is not a rule book without an index. Okay, well, the case I system agree. is a, a, a case system or the case system is a progressive index because as you progress through the rules, it's indexing where you need to go next for each mm -hmm. of the different cases. So, 
Yeah, Perm? that's a good point. Yeah, actually, that was the exact point. So the case system, obviously, the, the biggest advantage to it is being able to find something quickly, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just said. I think the problem with the traditional case system, and I don't think it's so much the case system. I think it's the way the case system is presented, the wall of text thing, right? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I've learned playing all these other games is that you have to you have to keep the reader's attention, right? You have to keep the eyes moving. You have to have things. So, for example, in a lot of my latest games, you'll see that I put a lot of it in most fearful sacrifice. I put a lot of colored boxes, mm -hmm. different colored boxes. We we throw some illustrations in the middle, an example of play, because you want to keep the reader's eyes darting around. Because if you get this wall of text thing. People are going to zone out, right? And when you get to the end of the rules, you're not going to remember what you just read. Mm -hmm. So it's yep. almost like a psychological thing, right? Where you're, you're, you're drawing them to different parts of the rules. So, and interestingly enough, it's funny you should mention this. I just came up with this situation with Plum Island Horror. So I wrote the original Plum Island Horror rules in a case system because I thought that was the GMT requirements, right? Mm -hmm. They have very strict code of this is how you write the rules. This is the system you use. Well, they, well, the developer, Ken Kuhn, decided in the middle that we're going to do something different with this. We don't want to present this like a traditional war game. So it's funny that Mark mentioned Fantasy Flight because I was actually going to actually brought out the Arkham Horror yeah. rules, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So you, what you have here is you have the Learn to Play book, which is what Mark was saying. This is the basic rule book. You can play the game off of this thing quite easily. You can read this and know how to play the game. And when you get to the fringe cases and the oddball things, you go into the reference book. So instead of throwing all this into for all the fringe cases into the main rules and then getting an intimidating 48-page rule book, now you got something a little bit more manageable. That's exactly what we did with Plum Island Art. It's got a main rule book, which is only dozen pages or something like that so you can play the game off of that and then if you want to find something specific about a particular area you can go to the reference book so that's interesting also it's interesting that there's some rules are written and i'll give you two specific examples of just recently so i got a kickstarter this is uh lost empires right so this is a really oh cool my goodness. card game i i learned i knew how to play this game and the first read of the rule book I came nice. out of it and I was like, okay, I know how to play this. This is easy. And it's got exactly what I talked about, right? It's got the illustrations. It's got the color. It's got the sidebars. It's got the examples of play. Everything's stuffed in there. On the other hand, I, I played, uh, I bought, um, um, oh, my God, what, uh, Devil Dogs, right? Mm -hmm. By Worthington at, at uh, PressCon. I always wanted that. The game is brilliant. I mean, it, it's it's a fantastic game, but it's so innovative. When you get done with the rule book, you have no idea how to play the game. I had, yeah. I had to go to videos to watch it. And that's the other point Mark made. I, I read the rule book, then I go walk, find a YouTube video, and that puts, now that I know generally how the game plays, the, the video kind of slams it all together, ties it all together for me. So, you know, a game that's very, that's innovative, that has a lot of different, you need lots of examples of play, make sure that people are interested in that rule book, because you're going to throw a lot of new ideas at them. And I guess one of my, one of my guilty things is that, I mean, I tend to over explain stuff. So a lot of the blind sword stuff's over explained because it's, it's not hard, but it's fairly new, right? Mm -hmm. So you need to kind of reinforce, especially with a war game, right? Because everybody's, every. Everybody's got that set, yep. work, right? You're in that lane of wargaming from, from the 70s, right? And <laughs> if you do anything different out of that lane, you have to double down on explaining. This is true. This is yeah. true. But and, um, another, another thing, and you brought it up too, Herm, um, is higher, if, if I was talking to a new wargame publisher, Hire an experienced layout guy. Oh yeah, you mm -hmm. just can't do your. You can't do your rules in Word and hope for the best. We hire a guy that, uh, the guy that did a most fearful sacrifice. Yeah, uh, used to lay out PlayStation magazine. He knows his stuff. 
Um, and he also did Crowbar, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg did. Uh, Greg is real good at layout, so he actually laid out um, uh, Armageddon War. But yeah, you got to hand. And the thing is, is that Herm gave him something great to work with too. Yeah. Herm gave him a document that GUM could look at and say, "Okay, I see what the intent is here." And mm -hmm. then he just did a professional layout job with it, and it ends right. up being. I think very readable. I, I think uh, mm -hmm. you know. I think fearful sacrifices. Yeah, is, I agree. It's a very easy game to learn. Yeah, I was actually going to say, as far as most fearful sacrifice went, that even for me, it wasn't that hard to keep stuff in my mind. And if I did make a mistake, the mistake I made was was mine. Like I came by it honestly, right? Mm -hmm. I remember a, a goof I made. I think Herm was one of the ones that pointed it out. Uh, with artillery fire, where I was firing over some of my my oh, Confederate right. troops, right? right? And I'm thinking, well, this you know kind of makes sense. And it's like, no, you can't do that. And it was in the rules, and I had simply just missed it. So it wasn't like it was misworded or anything bad or anything like that. You know, it just was there, and I goofed, which is you know going to happen sometimes. But it wasn't right. due to piss poor rules, right? Uh, something that drives me nuts, and I think this goes to what you're talking about, layout, Mark, is the, the page layout. So if you're looking at the rule book and you're reading a section, I don't want to have the very tail end of that section on that next page where yeah. it's just a sentence or two, right? Because that makes yeah. it so freaking easy to miss. And I've had it's that. It's funny in other you should say books. that because when, when I'm writing the rules and that happens, I will go delete words and try to get it to get to shove back onto that page. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, because I which is what happens, happens in layout too. On the very bottom, and then one line next to the title, and then it keeps going. Right. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's so easy. If that is on that next page and it's too short, you know, it's a sentence, two sentences, you're gonna miss it. Your yeah. brain's just not gonna pay attention. You're gonna go right to that next section. Right. Easy and way I, to fix that is throwing an image point. and carry down the next paragraph or two to the next page if you have to yep. continue on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I also think what Mo was saying and Mark too is um, because so many games are coming out now, which I think is what Mo was saying, is that there's just such a volume of games that we didn't have back in the 70s and 80s, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I got a Kickstarter, Massive Darkness 2. Man, it was $200. It was came in a box like this. I couldn't believe it. I sold it already because the barrier to entry for me to like just get the game up and going was it was too high. You got right? the the second one? Yeah. Why? The first one was so bad. <laughs> I'm just like, what are you thinking here, buddy? The second one is a different system, but the thing is that like I said, it was so much rules reading, it was so much stuff, and I was like, I don't have time for I don't have time mm -hmm. to play this. Yeah, it's got like and 10 know, sheets of counters. You know, we get Kickstarters all the time that are just overwhelming. And it's like, this is a different age, man. I don't have six months to play this game. I'm getting another Kickstarter next week. <laughs> 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 you know, the rules are, might be a, a little bit more efficient. Maybe the game's a little more efficient. And, I, and I'll actually get that to the table. Like I said, I'll get this Lost Empires on the table because it's it's short and sweet and makes sense. Well, well, here, here, here's a question. Well, on that engine. Was that way, remember? I'm sorry. Dark right. Dungeon. Right. Exactly. I got two boxes. I, I can't tell you how big because my arms don't show up. But uh, two boxes, eight inches thick, a foot and a half wide. And it's just so intimidating that, you know, reviewers look at it and go, oh, my God, there's 80 miniatures, so it must be worth $150. But for me... Nope, but I got Onslaught, the D and D game, and some reviewers say, "Oh, it's not worth one hundred and twenty dollars." I tell you what, I played mm -hmm. Onslaught three times. Right. That's worth something right there. Yeah, yeah, you brought that to PressCon. That was a great game. I'll tell you, yeah. Darkest Dungeon. The the real problem with that game was it was dark. It was too dark. <laughs> I'm I'm not joking. When I filmed it, because I actually filmed and reviewed that game, I yeah. struggled with my lighting for hours just okay. trying to get it to show up on mm -hmm. camera because if I had my lighting turned up even the littlest amount it washed out all the components the the pretty tiles the the pretty cardstock thing the I forget the stances right 
all that stuff yeah. that looks so great. The moment I turned up the lighting just a little bit to be able to film it because of that glossy coating and the fact that they were all so uh -huh. dark immediately washed out. I had to film mm -hmm. it in a completely dark room to actually get it to wow. show up. Did you like it? Did you like the game? The game is okay if you are a Darkest Dungeon fan. If you're a big Darkest Dungeons fan and you like board games, okay. Because they did a relatively good job of translating the video game over to a board game experience. Mm -hmm. If okay. you are not a big Darkest Dungeon fan, then your money would be better spent into a different dungeon crawl because that's all it is. It's a dungeon crawl set in that IP, right? right. And there are many others that you'll get more bang for your buck than you will that one. That one I would probably wait for like a second edition where they unscrew up all those components that are just darker than shit. Because it's not just yeah. that it's too yeah. dark to film, it's too dark to play. And that was a, yeah. a running complaint among every reviewer. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. All right. See now, Herm, you brought up that game that you basically, you got in from Kickstarter and you're like, yeah, you're out of here and you sold it. Um, mm -hmm. Is that now, now do you say that that is a fault of the game or a, not a fault, but um, maybe a shortcoming? No, I think it's a fault of the game. The, the game's actually been well reviewed. Like, yeah. and like Kippy said, I had Massive Darkness 1 and I hate, I didn't like it. Got mm -hmm. rid of it. Massive Darkness 2 had a different system. But, and again, you're right. It might be my fault that I got whatever Kickstarter. Well, not your fault. It just doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit what you want and what you need. Is it, where I'm, I was right. Going. At this point in my life, it's again, it's that whole thing of you look at it and go, wow, that looks really good. I need to have all of it. And then when you get it, you go, wait a minute, I can't play this. <laughs> right. And the other thing, give me about Simon, go separate from the rules, is their miniatures, they store them in these. these plastic holders that are pr formed for each of the miniatures and there's, yep. there's dozens of miniatures so you look at it and you go wait a minute i have to take out each one of these guys right and then i to get it stored again i gotta find where they all go again oh, yeah. this is there you don't. No, you, no, you don't hurt tell them how i store my game all right well mark Back just takes box. picks the board I up take all and the dumps everything into the box, box. Up on the shelf. <laughs> Honestly, I'm I'm with you on that. I'm thinking rip the plastic sheeting out that holds all the minis, yeah. and then just put them in and just be well, done I, with I it. I almost did it. Then I just decided, you know what? I'm not even going to bother because if I want to sell it, I got to keep all that stuff. And to True. most point, it, it was not a fault of the game, but the rules were still just so thick, and there's just so many games for me to play now. It's like, okay, you're not going to get played because I yeah. got other games that are smaller that I'm going to. Now, maybe that's my particular situation because I'm designing most of the day and I just take a break and play something, you know, for my entertainment. Um, so it might be my particular situation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason I was saying that is because, you know, one of the criticisms that it's like war games are getting, there's a lot of criticism headed towards war games lately from non war gamers that are saying they want to get into war games and they say rules are one of the barriers to entry. It's like, okay, well, is it rules of barrier to entry or is that the games that you've looked at are not really for you or at least not right. for you at this because time? Because I've seen some Euro game rules and they blow me yeah. away as far as yeah. you know, yeah. I mean, yeah. I'm looking at it. I, and I and I can attest from personal experience. I was in a Euro game group for a couple of months and and even the ones that Jester plays, I look at that and go, oh my God, there's no way I'm going to try to tackle this thing. I, uh, I was at a con and I was sharing a room with uh, Uva Eichert and Byron Collins. Uva! So, Uva. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you shared a room with Uva? <laughs> yeah, I did. I did. I did. I'm, I'm ashamed to admit it. <laughs> um, but um, anyway, um, so there was this, I'm trying to remember the name of the Euro game. It was like Puerto Rico or something like that. And right. so Byron said, y'all got to play this game. It's great. It's great. And so Uva and I said, okay, all right. So Uva and I are both on our laptops working while Byron's setting this thing up. It took so long to set up and hence was so complicated that we were shutting our laptops and ready to hit the sack before Byron even got it set up. Mm -hmm. The point is not to trash Puerto Rico. It might be God's gift to games. I just don't know. The point is to say that Euro games and Ameritrash games are not as complex as war games would be an incorrect statement. I mean, right. it all depends on the game. And I think you hit the nail on the head, Mo, when you said what it is, is you haven't found a war game you're interested in yeah. yet. 
And there are, I mean, there are war games that I read the rules to. I say, this is just insane. You know, if you've, yeah. you've got hidden units and you've got sighting ranges, I close the book right there. But mm -hmm. hopefully you don't have sighting ranges in Fearful Sacrifice. Do you harm? No. You no. <laughs> never do that. You would never do that. Uh, come, in the, but, coming in the expansion, though. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> It's not an expansion. It's a full game that's coming. Uh, uh, but anyway, um, so yeah, I think that that could be the case. They just haven't found something they're interested in, something with the right type of rules. Well, there's a question from Mark. What game is it that you published that you are most proud of? I don't know. The most fearful <laughs> sacrifice is the right answer with Herm right there. No, it's yeah. okay. You can, say, <laughs> you can say whatever you like. <laughs> Well, I mean, that one old did school, when... I would say old school tactical, right? Yep. Um, well, old school's good. I, you know, I you honestly, goodness, I like every single one of them. Yep. I like all of them. Back to the lock and load days to now, uh, they all are fun. They've all had their place for certain game tables, and certain gamers haven't liked them. Certainly, a most fearful sacrifice is one of the ones I'm very proud of, but it's... Mm -hmm. Herman, I think, have told a lot of people. I know we talk about it. It was a bit of a perfect storm because I knew I knew how well Herm could design Civil War games. And I knew how well we could put a Civil War game together, meaning we, Flying Pig Games, not cutting any corners with the goal of trying to make an epic game about Gettysburg. And the whole thing just came together. And people and, really and we had the perfect it. map artist too. Yeah. Rick Barber, that yeah. was his that was his jam. Get yep. it well, I'll tell you we something did. you should take as a, a compliment here, because a lot of the, the playthroughs I do, I'll do them as long as I can. Games of a certain size, you just you can't play through them. I'll, I'll do a hundred videos trying to play through a whole campaign. But yours was one of the ones that I played through as long as I could, and it didn't come off the table because um, I wanted it to come off. It came off because it had to come off because I had other things that had to replace it. And for me, that's a lot because that's a civil war game and I'm not a huge civil war guy, right? I've never been big into civil war games. So for most fearful sacrifice to be on my table for that long and film that much and me not be tired of it says something about the game. Oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Hey, I'm blown old smoke. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> but but that's the thing you know when it comes to learning games uh one of the things that i have one of my secret weapons is uh these and there's a little one that i'll have in my pocket and then there's a bigger one is that a tablet or a notepad notebooks i have a bunch of notebooks oh, okay. and when i play um whether i'm playing uh if i'm playing for uh any type of coverage that i want to do on a game review after action report whatever um I will write down a running commentary in the, in the book. I'll be like, okay, turn one, this happened. And then this was a response. And these guys took this and these guys lost this, whatever. Um, and then there was one, I did a running commentary similar, but I didn't say put in my notebook. I did it on Twitter when I played the night, which was that uh, night of the living dead game that white dog games came out with. Mm -hmm. And I had a blast doing it. Cause I used to do that a lot uh, several years ago on Twitter where I'll be playing a game. I'll just take pictures and then I'll just put a commentary about what's going on here. Oh, these guys oh, just yeah. smashed these guys in the face, you know, so on and so forth or whatever. And I just started having a good time adding in yep. the character comments that, you know, mm -hmm. like Barbara can't hit shit with a shotgun and, you know, <laughs> and she's missing. And then, and then I had the girl, I forget what her name was, the little girl. Um, I had her say, yeah, what the fuck, Barb? Give him back the shotgun, you know, because she couldn't hit anything, you know? And it, but these were, these were the lines going through my head because I was having fun playing the game. And that's what you yeah. want. You want to have a narrative. You just hit the nail on the head, Mo, as yeah. far as the, the reaction, let's say, to Dawn of the Zeds, which is mm -hmm. my favorite um, reactions are people doing exactly that. They're just yep. telling the story of their game without talking about rules or anything. They just... <laughs> reiterating it like it's a novel or something right yeah yeah and to me that's what that's what those kinds of games should do yes and yeah. tell the story you want that story and you want right. to be and, and when you're playing you want to have that story be part of your experience that's right. the point of playing you know mm -hmm. uh now 
on the other hand, when you're playing uh, maybe a, a more multi-layered or more complex war game or something like that, then you're getting into the cerebral puzzle of trying to solve a tactical or an operational problem. And then you're taking notes in a different way. Mm -hmm. You're writing down, yeah. okay, well, I can't forget these guys over here. can't forget these guys over there. Or like me, when I did my NATO AAR and I completely forgot playing as a Soviet, I completely forgot about my flank. And when I switched over, I switched hats and I played NATO, I was like, Holy crap, I totally left my flank open. I can win this game right now. And I was just like, I can't believe I did this, you know, but <laughs> it was fun. And you can, you can completely fool yourself. But uh, when it comes to learning rules, like I said, uh, notebooks are great to have with you because you never know what's going to happen you know, during a game. You can play something and you'll, you'll, oh, do I have a question on this? I'm not sure. Let me write that, let me write that down and I'll go back to it later rather than stopping going to BGG or a Facebook group or CSW or something like that. And then falling into that rabbit hole of looking for the answer. And then you're like, Oh, finally, I, wow, I've been looking at it for an hour and a half. Right. I don't feel like playing that game anymore right now. You take yourself out of it. So it's better. Exactly sometimes that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You find the answer and then you go, what was I doing? You go back exactly. to the game. Well, you don't remember right. what you were doing. I kind of do it the opposite way. I'll jot down on a piece of paper, what I'm doing. Mm hmm like Soviet's first division move. And then I go look up the problem. So when I come back, I go, oh, that's what I was doing. But I have a friend, uh, Deborah, I won't use her last name because I don't know if she wants it used, uh, who runs Geek, Geek Gamers. And what oh, yeah. she does is solo RPGs. That's, I mean, that's that hasn't always been her YouTube channel thing, but that's, her thing and she talks about when she's creating these rpgs these solitaire she only does solitaire rpgs mm. how she's taking notes and then how frequently a whole story starts developing mm. as she's taking notes uh so i absolutely think that that probably happens for a lot of people mo yeah right. and the other thing too that i found is um because i've dabbled with at different levels with uh, development or, you know, and I've, I've got some ideas that I write down about games. I'll just come up with an idea on something that I just saw. And I'm like, wow, what if this was done in this way or something like that? I get my notebook out and I'll write it down because I'm like, mm -hmm. here's what to do in this situation. I get that a lot with like tactical games. How do you, how could you make this feel a little more realistic without being overcomplicated? Well, here's an idea. And then I'll just throw it into a notebook and then, you know, it'll just sit there. Maybe it'll get used in the future. Maybe it won't. Or I'll say, hey, you know, you got an idea. You're doing this game. How about doing this? I'll pull up my notebook and I'll say, here's here's something. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that'll fit or it won't fit, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it keeps the creative mind going. And I think that's kind of neat. But writing things down, I found from a young age, especially for me, is really important. And it helps you retain things, which is another good reason about writing down when you're doing games. You know, create your own play rates too, your own little shortcut I, things. It's funny. I was just going to say that going back <laughs> to what you said about player aids, yeah, which are extremely important, right? A well-made mm -hmm. player raid will get you through those games quickly. Sure. Is I used to do the same thing you did. I I did player aids that I developed, you know, that I designed myself to get me through a certain game. Mm -hmm. and, and now that I think about it, oddly enough. I had a player aid made up for World at War, the first edition that actually got put on BGG and had like hundreds of downloads. Because I took all of Mark's rules and I just did player aid, yep. you know, and, and put it up there and, and people loved it. And I think that's a That's because the rules game. were so poorly written. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, rules are so easy to write. Errata should never happen. Well, that's according uh, to Jester. Is just the oh line? god! Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Oh my god! Well, yeah, I like it. Yeah. yeah. There's there's an appropriate because I, I do. I think he's a great guy, but I would love to turn over production of a game to him from the time <laughs> the rules are handed in, and then take it all the way through all the counterproof yep. and all the rule proof and all that, getting back the hard copies, proofing those, and then talk to him about. How there should never be a mistake. Right. If never. we were all charging 200 bucks for a war game and we had enough people to have two or three people on staff to do all that kind of stuff, mm. sure, you would have a point. Yeah. But it's tough to catch everything. Well, and the other thing we're always wrestling with, Mo, I can tell you as a fact, is 
if you go and put everything into your rule book, then people complain the rule book's too long or too complex yes. or too wordy or whatever. Then you try to do something like, well, I'm going to do an eight page rule book. And then you haven't covered everything, right? I mean, there's a, there's a, there's a series that came out just now with great series of games called downfall of empires and downfall of the third, right? Oh, yeah. Beautiful games, great games. But there are so many questions on BGG. Exactly. So many questions on BGG because they tried to make it as right concise. As, as tiny yeah. as as concise as possible. Those movement well, rules. Too many, uh, so, I gotta say two things about that. Number one, yeah. we couldn't even figure out how to do the combat. Am I right? Yep, am you're, I right. right? you're right. And number two, let me get this straight. Wait a minute, hold on, time out. You didn't know how to do you didn't know how to do the combat? No, no, no. In a war no, game. We didn't. We didn't. We, wow. we had a way we were doing it. We just weren't sure it was correct. Oh, right. And number two, Herm, are you trying to say that war gamers like to complain? <laughs> <laughs> Never. That would be an understatement. But you know, <laughs> that's finding a good that, point. Yeah, finding that that sweet spot balance that's between too wordy and you know, not worth and keeping it short and sweet mm -hmm. is really tough. Well, you know, to your point, what you said is exactly true because that's one of the things that um, people have com complained about with uh, NATO. It's an 87 page rule book. It's like, yeah, because he's extremely verbose and he makes sure that there's there's no wiggle room and misunderstanding. There's no ambiguity. So right. Right. if there is, it's very, 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 very minor. And what, you're really reading too much into it. Uh, NATO, the Cold War goes hot from oh, Compass. Okay. I, mean, um, I, I have it. I haven't had a chance to play. Yeah, you look at the rules. It's 87 pages. That's because Bruce did such a, a deep job on making sure he explained the rules completely. And then a lot mm -hmm. of people complained about that. Right. It's like, well, he could have made it like a 35 page rule book, but or maybe 30 to 40 pages, somewhere in that range. Mm -hmm. But then people will be like, well, in this instance, and if this happens, and if well, that's why it's 87 pages. So that way it takes edge cases I remember, out. <laughs> I remember. Uh, Tom Vassell got in magnificent style and he complained that the rule book was too long. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's hobby gamer mentality for you. You know, yeah, they, I mean, they want the short, game. sharp, fast, you know, rule books. Yeah. Well, yeah. could you imagine him game. doing one of his uh, board game box dumps with a war game? Yeah. Doing that with like, uh, what is it called? War in the Pacific? Hell no. Yeah. Uh -huh. No. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. He's, he does the hobby game. So his rule books have to be rather, yeah, rather short. Exactly. Yeah. Anything like that would blow them away. I get that. Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you something that I've been thinking about recently myself is the fact that I actually have to try to slow down because I always think I've been trying to go too fast because I wanted to to stay going, stay productive, get something up. So if I've, mm -hmm. I've got multiple tables around and if I'm working on one game, filming it, I'm trying to learn another. And right. so many times I've caught myself making mistakes. And just like you guys, right, when they're hard on you guys about errata, they're extremely hard on us if we make an error when we're... Yeah, if you play something wrong, right? Exactly, right? Yeah. But I think that, in a sense, that part of it is my fault because I understand I do have that limitation. My memory's shit, right? It's, it's not going to get better, so I need to slow down and put more focus into what I'm working on at the moment. When I was holding up Carrier Battle earlier... Uh, I had to push it back. I over wanted to already have videos up on that game and it's just kicking my ass. And what you were talking about, Herm, with the uh, the wall of text, this one yeah. fits. I don't know if you've seen the rule book to it. No. It, it's oh my learning though. Dude, it's killing me. And combined <laughs> well, with that well, medicine, he, I fall asleep every well, time I try yeah, to read it. I was going to say that that's part of it, but it's program learning, which a lot of people do like. And I think it's a great thing too to introduce concepts in chunks and let you take a stepped approach. And then the other thing is, don't worry about it because I have a learning plate. It's coming out on that. So, oh, but I think you have to have an example of play <laughs> after each chunk. Yeah, right? yeah that's so what it's doing. Reading the legalese, and then you should have an example of play that kind of ties that all together, or at least yes. a good chunk of it together. But yeah, see, and then the person can say, ah, I see how that all works. Okay, great. Now we go to the next part. That would be I, okay if it wasn't for the fact that the way that it's broken up, it's like the first scenario is based on like three pages and the second scenario is based on like five pages. But then you get to the third scenario and it's based on 25 pages. Uh, and yeah. it's, yeah, it's it, hard. Yeah, yeah, it goes from little chunks 
to here's a big pill, try to swallow it. Right. right. And for me, well, I just I am getting crushed. I'm having to to switch to something else to film for now while I try to get this in my head, because if I did it now, I would make too many mistakes and I wouldn't right. do the game justice or anyone else justice by trying to film it right now. Well, I've you know, tried that, to learn games like that. But before I forget, I, I do want to tell. Jester also has a valid point. And that's a I'm, first. I'm going to give me. <laughs> I'm going to give a quick example to express this point. Uh, we made a mistake with uh, Old School Tactical Volume 1, Second Edition. Um, one, one of the things I do when I, uh, when I design a game is, is that I get the counter sheets done. Done, by some definition of the word print out those counters and test with those counters. So if I'm designing a scenario and I go, oh, I need nine T-80 platoons. Oh, there's only eight in the counter mix. Ah, I need to add, I go back to the counter mix, make sure I add one, okay? Well, we, we screwed up with four counters in Old School Tactical Volume 1, uh, second edition. It's missing some counters and I... And we got them in recently from the printer and we're mailing out all these counters to these guys. Okay, fair enough. But the point is, is yes, we try our best. And yes, we're a small company. But the point is, is we still take people's money. And if you pay a hundred bucks for a game, if you're paying full retail, you expect a full game. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, Jester's got a point. I mean, sure. you know, nobody says, look, the game's worth 100, but we're going to give sell to you for 92 because there might be mistakes, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, we're all trying as hard as we can, uh, but I, I know where Jester is coming from with that. I mean, he, he has a point. Mm -hmm. No, there, there's a point there, but I think really to, you know, the, the he, has to, he also has to understand there has to be a balance, too. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfectly errata free game the first time through because uh, or error free game, I should say, because not only can it happen, can a mistake happen when the designer writes it, the developer gets their hands on it, the rule book editor gets their hands on it, then it goes to the printer. And I'm not even talking about just the rules, I'm talking about the player aids, the counters, everything else. The printer can get it and screw up the files. You know, th those things happen. They could miss something entirely. Uh, on the, they can send you a perfect white box or a, a proof copy and say, and you go, wow, this is perfect. And then when they go to go into production, they make a mistake on their printing side of things and they ship everything minus one counter sheet. Uh -huh. yeah. And that does happen, you know, because it's run by people and people are imperfect. So, yeah. 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 And proofreading is not as easy as people think it is. I've, mm -hmm. and I'm not exaggerating, I've literally looked at, Counter sheet twelve times, and the thirteenth time I find something I missed. It happens yep. all the time. Well, yep. see, that's well, what some crowbar, publishers do. They keep it two in house. They've got to get it out to strange eyes, at least to an extent. So I agree. Blind see. testing and blind. I so agree. Is definitely valuable. Yes, Nate, but, I couldn't agree more. But I can't tell you the times in my career no one that we've up. gotten rules done. We put them up. We advertise they're up, they're free downloads, send out a newsletter with a link, we hear nothing. The game gets published, within two days we have 17 people correcting our capitalization. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, you I, do? I don't fault you. I, I understand exactly what you're saying. The They want perfection, but they only want perfection on their terms. Well, that's the thing. The community has to get involved. You know, to a degree, people have to step up. Greatly. You know, it really does. You know, a perfect example uh, being that we're talking about Jester with you know his channel and, and stuff about talking about Volters when you came out with Volters. Mm -hmm. you, you know, he had talked about it. Hey, you're gonna need some help checking out rules, and he posted right. the information up there, and you got what a dozen people or so. You said that reached right. out that you yeah. sent out the rule books to, and you only heard from a few people. So yeah, if that happens. You know, people yeah, are not always going to step up and get involved. Yeah, and, and gamers think that they want to participate in the in the play testing or development of a game, and then they realize it actually it's work. It's a lot of work. <laughs> work. Yeah. yeah. 
wait a minute, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I can I can tell you the other day I just finished. It was a real busy week of work, and um, I was just I've been trying to get this uh, rule book I'm working on uh, done. So I I was like I need to get this done. I don't have time really on Sunday to do it. So I sat down on Saturday and I took a couple little breaks throughout the course of the process. But I ran through my final edits. This is the final edits now. Final edits and double checking, and I got finished at three thirty in the morning on Sunday. It was a 12 hour session. So wow. it happens. It happens. It's, it's work. So if you're not willing to put in the hours, then it's, it's something that you need to find a way to help in other ways, whether it's play testing or just proofing a player aid card or something, but you got to put in the effort if you want to help make products better. You know, if you, yeah. if you want to help the community, because this is a small community. So, you know, get involved in some way and help out. Right. Yeah, and you're right. It is a lot of work. I mean, if you take yeah. pride in your work, I mean, even small games that I do for White Dog or or Tiny Battle and all that. I mean, we're friend and I play for three months. You know, yeah. on ETS, almost you know three times a week. We're working and working and working on this thing. It doesn't matter how small the game is. You still want to put out something that's respectful. You just don't want to pump them out. Tiny Battle. There you go. Tiny Battle. Do a bit of Tiny Battle yeah. right there. Yeah. This is that one that. Um, Brian sent to me. That's right. And Brian is here too. Brian Patterson, stand up and be counted. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the other thing too, this goes back to something that Mark had brought up earlier. And I, you all brought it up actually uh, at different points is videos, watching playthroughs and stuff on YouTube. Right. Um, the one thing about the playthroughs on YouTube is uh, – Caveat, caveat emptor, as they say, you know, you have to be careful because you don't know how well, or you have to vet the video and you have to vet the person who created it because it's like right. they could, they could be doing the rules completely wrong, or at least one or two rules or something like that. Odds are most playthroughs are going to be wrong at some point in there because. Uh, yeah. I'm just going to say you, you can almost count on an error somewhere, yeah. but for me, they're valuable because they just put everything into context, right? Yes. Far yeah. as like how they get exactly. Yeah. Right. And you yeah. might see something that they do wrong. Go, oh no! Wait a minute! You did that wrong. But at least but then you they know teach you something wrong, else. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, but then they may teach you something else. So you're like, oh, that's how that works. Oh, okay. I couldn't. Oh, I couldn't get exactly. that. Exactly. You know? yeah. yeah. That exactly happened the other day to sure. me watching YouTube. I forget what. Game, but it was like, oh my god! I didn't even think of that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it! I'm a dumbass. How did I not know that? Jeez. <laughs> you know, it, it's true though, and that's why. I, I think you know, that's why I started doing a learn to play stuff because I think it really is important and easier uh, for people to see visually and to mm -hmm. see the game played. And right. some people were saying, oh, yeah, but you should use the game itself. It's like, you know, they want to see the components like, you know what, it's easier to do it with a flattened version on a, on a vassal or even a, you know, a tabletop simulator than it would ever be to do on a tabletop because doing it on a tabletop, your lighting has to be perfect. And mm -hmm. you can't cast shadows as you're reaching for, for counters. You're not going to have right. that problem on Vassal. And it's right. just so much easier. It, you can record a, a video in one to two hours and then edit it down and, and add assets you need and stuff like that. Have a video done a lot faster than you would if you did it live. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's be real. When we're doing these videos, we all have day jobs. So we don't have time to sit down and set up a studio and do that at home and fly to someone's house and do it at their house or something like that too. So <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well Stuka's got the best setup. I've I've tried yeah. to emulate kind of what he's got and that uh mm -hmm. that little grain thing I sent you a picture of has yeah. helped. But they uh they don't get it. Like these Euro gamers for the most part, there's a map size maybe, right? Usually it's it's smaller than that. But when it comes to war games, these things can be up to six feet. Right. Yeah. So you can't yeah. just set up a tripod. Fifteen square feet, some of them. Yeah. Yeah. You, you gotta <laughs> have something that has the ability to move. So you've yeah. got to have the ability to move around the room. You've got to have uh, the ability to not catch echoes. Right. So I got to think about the uh, the room itself. Like the office that I'm in is surrounded by those little soundproofing boards. Right. So mm -hmm. it reflects my voice back in. Uh, the lighting, like Mo was talking about, so it has to be ambient. It can't be directly on it because you glare, so it has to go up to the ceiling and bounce back. This is all shit I learned over the years. No one told me this crap when I first started doing it. I just was like, uh, uh, yeah. like what Harm and Mark were talking about. I wanted to see the games played, and I couldn't find any videos years ago. 
right? right. The, the, there was one person who was actually doing playthroughs, and it was Callendale, right? He was the only one who was playing any uh, war games of, of note. Yeah. And okay. I was, oh, well, you know what? I'm, I'm busted up from the Marines. I've got time on my hand. I, I bet you I can do this. First war games I ordered were uh, Absolute Victory and uh, what was it? World at War by uh, GMT. So I oh yeah I was like oh I'll so just you went in with cement shoes on yeah I had no idea what Back I was doing bottom. I was thinking yeah this would be great and I was telling yeah. I remember telling my wife I was like oh, do you know that there are war games out there that takes like months to learn this could be awesome I'm thinking <laughs> you know this this could be so much fun and then I actually started at it and like reading the rule book I'm like okay this was this this was a bad idea I might have got my head a little uh, in too deep. But it worked out over time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's a valuable service. I mean, look what, what Rodney Smith has done for the general yeah. gaming community with Watch mm-hmm. It Played. I mean, that's, I mean, oh, granted, yeah. you can't really do that with a war game. They're too, they're too big and, you know. Could. Well, it hard could. Well, hard them. Yeah. But Ben Harsh, is that his name? Ben Harsh? Oh, yeah. Ben Harsh does ben a Harsh. good job. Yeah. Yes. 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 Mm-hmm. Now, he's got to do it in multiple. Yes. Multiple. Uh, episodes segments but, yeah yeah and that's the best way to do it i mean i yeah. wouldn't um uh, you know i if i had personally if i had an hour and a half video telling people how to play a game i would publish it in three 30 minute segments you have to and break it that's, up that's how you triple your content triple your fun with ever clear ever clear gum 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 <laughs> You can, uh, Mo would tell you, you can see the analytics, right? YouTube yeah. will show you the analytics, your view time, how many people, where they drop off, uh, the demographics, off, yeah. all that, right? Yeah. And that's why all my videos cut off between 25 and 30 minutes because that's that's, that's the attention span. Anything past that, they pretty much zone right. out. I don't right? know. I, I think so. when I go through my YouTube thing and if it's an hour and a half long video i'm like all right i don't have time for that now you know and see i don't know if that's really true because yeah. 20 25 minutes may even be too long because what do you think what do you think is the biggest hottest thing on youtube right now the shorts, shorts. but you, you know, can't so do a war game in a like short 500 shorts you could teach somebody a rule book <laughs> you like one minute each each short <laughs> the you're, you're putting about ben harsh is right ben right ben harsh does it exactly right for a war game yeah. If, if that's the war game you want to play, right? So he does sure. Combat Commander and, and, you know, all the big all the big ones. But, man, if you want to learn how to play a game, he's the guy to go to. Yeah. I heard there was this lady, Becca Scott, who did videos. She's awesome. She <laughs> does uh, <laughs> Fantasy Flight and all that stuff, yes. Oh, trust me, I don't. <laughs> she did talk about hey, house plants and I'd you watch You laugh, <laughs> you laugh, but that's how I learned Blackstone Fortress. Yeah. No shit. Good. Really? The lady you knew what she does. Up, yep. up, up one side and down the other. No yep. kidding. Yep. Yeah. When I played Blackstone Fortress, I want to say this in public, all the way through till I was able to open the secret envelope at the end. I you haven't done that said? myself. <laughs> you know what it said? <laughs> what it what said? Drink more Ovaltine. Drink more Ovaltine. <laughs> Drink more Ovaltine. <laughs> Drink more Ovaltine. <laughs> The illusion no, is really gone. Did. I played Blackstone all the way through. Nice. Hey, was the robot your favorite character? No, my favorite character was the uh, the female uh, elf. Oh, really? I mean, by, by the time I got to the end, I mean, she was just, she had some cards, let her like re-roll all attacks if she was adjacent and stuff. She was just kicking ass. It sucks. It's uh, really hard to get some of the expansions for that. My, uh, my brother found out I had the... Uh, forget which one is the the one that came with a cultist and something else to it and he was begging me like please let me buy it off of me like no i can't do that he's like but you're not even going to play it i'm like yeah but it looks good on my shelf it's a whole collection kill you know, roy here you can you're killing get me 500 man. you can get 500 for that yeah that's the first <laughs> i think that that's ascension i'm not um, talking about yeah i think that's it yeah yep yep and that sucks yep. kill roy is great I'm not talking about your playthroughs, Kilroy. He's saying, I'm right here. You don't have to talk about my playthroughs being wrong in a third person. <laughs> Trust me, you should know it by now. If I was going to say your playthrough sucks, I'd be like, except for that Kilroy guy, he sucks. But no, you do a great job, man. And you know what? We all make mistakes. And that's, that's you know, part and parcel. I mean, let's, let's face it. How much money are we making from doing YouTube? Pretty much nothing. So uh, it's not like people sit there, you know, the thing that cracks me up is when people 
watch your content. And we're like, well, I'm a subscriber to your channel. You owe me a five hour playthrough of this game. It's like, no, I don't. I don't owe you anything. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry. I do this on my time and because I love it and I want to share with the community. And I think all the content creators feel exactly the same. And if, if, you know, people are going to demand of your time. It's like, well, then you're going to write a check to me and mm -hmm. say, yeah. here's, here's $5,000 for that five hours of your time. Right. Because right. it's not just the five hours playthrough. It's the time editing and everything else. It all adds up. So it's more than five hours. It'd probably come out to a five hour video with proper editing and stuff like that. Uh, 30, 40 hours of editing minimum. Yeah. You that, know, so that hundred bucks from YouTube isn't worth the, uh the the crap they're pushing. you get a hundred bucks dude wow every so often like they'll they just direct deposit in my uh, account i've i've never kept track of how often it deposits i just get an email every now and then your ad yeah. sense has, has deposited you can set it to whatever amount you want you know whatever limit so once it hits that limit of revenue then it just deposits this is true me and our mike says 99 percent of playthroughs have errors i don't think anyone's being singled out and no we're not because no, i think that's wrong I think it's only ninety seven point five. Come on, I disagree with you. Even the uh, even <laughs> the biggest wrong. guy, Rado, he has a whole um, closed caption dedicated to covering his errors. Yes. All right. Remember uh, what's his name? Rado runs through. That's it. Oh, Rado, yeah, yeah. He covers all you the got, errors. Like, you got a you got a guilty complex over here. <laughs> I know it's me. I know <laughs> right, it, Jason, it. it was Kilroy was here. <laughs> the jig is up. Uh, he's so that <laughs> twice during the segment. Uh, and there's Brian who sent yeah. you the Devil Dogs game. That's all right. And, uh, I'll tell you what. I'm going to take uh, Devil Dogs. I'm going to throw it in a garbage can. I'll win YouTube video of the year for 2023. <laughs> no, burn it. Burn it. Oh, I actually want to play it. I, don't burn know. It I want to well, be able to get it you. back out. <laughs> Jester hey, says I'm it only takes you. you 20 minutes to piss off viewers so his videos can't last more than 10. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Gippy, the uh, Devil Dogs is a great game. It just, it needed, now the way I learned how to play it, other than reading the rule book and going, oh my God, I don't know how to play this game, is I watched, like what we were just talking about, I watched the Players Aid play it, right? I watched Grant and Alex talk about how they played it, and I go, oh, that's how it works. You know, mm -hmm. again, that was an eye-opening thing. You just watch somebody else play it. I didn't think they did playthroughs. I thought they just did reviews. what Gippy has. Yeah, you're you're thinking of the word. If you've got the tiny battle game, yeah, you're talking about oh, oh, Finiski. Oh, oh, He's got the right. tiny battle. Yeah, the, okay. the rules so in that game actually make sense. I, I was wondering. I'm like, how is this hard to learn? It's got like three pages. <laughs> it's way, it's easy enough comments, for Gimpy to learn. <laughs> the other yeah. comments on the chat. I got to reiterate that the blind blind testing and blind uh, proofreaders is invaluable because. What they were saying is true, and I, I know Mark agrees with this. You can get into this tunnel, right? Even with people you use for a long time, you get in this tunnel of you already know what you mean, and then the other person even knows what you mean, and a third person might not know what you mean by exactly. the way writing things. And there is every designer out there should send their stuff out to a blind and just say, here, just read this and tell me if you understand this. Yeah, but yeah. people don't get those prototypes are expensive. Like really not even prototypes, expensive. just reading a rule. They're reading well, yeah. The I mean, just reading the rules with a map. Reading a rule book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No. Yeah. And the great thing about what you say about prototypes for me, I use TTS now. I haven't built a uh, physical prototype in a year and a half. I just build it on TTS. David Thompson told me <laughs> a year and a half ago. He goes, "Dude, you got to check out this TTS. It's great for building playtest kits." So I started doing it, and what it does is what, what you say is I can send Mo or Mark or or Gimpy a kit just by going on TTS. Here you go. Yeah, it's electronic. Go play. Yeah, I actually I um, every week, twice a week. We Fred and I play. He's in New York. I'm in Tennessee. We can get all this stuff done without any any. I I alter. I edit things immediately on the spot as we're playing. Yeah, I covered yeah. some of uh, David Thompson's games. Uh, Shit, I can't remember. The French one. The French one about the... <laughs> the French one. Resist? The yeah, French that's it. One. Resist. Yeah. Uh, back when yeah, he was, was prototyping. I thought you were talking about La Resistance. Oh, that was Hispanic, right? Yeah. Yeah. No. no, that's oh, French. Oh. No, Resist yeah, is Spanish. Which French one? 
the which one was David resist? Thompson? I thought resist was about the Spanish resist. Civil War. Oh, maybe you're right. Maybe it's the Spanish American War. No. Uh, no? Anyhow, no, it might be. You played it, Nate. I defer to you. Hold up. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> don't let us see anything you don't want us to see. That is resist. Okay. Is that Spanish right. American or, or World War Two? It's my Spanish American. Spanish Civil War, damn it. Spanish Civil War. Who oh, told wait, you? I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say Spanish American. I meant to say Spanish Civil War. I'm an idiot. <laughs> ah, all right. That was my fault. Sorry. See, now this this is a, a great point we're, we're already talking about here with the blind blind reads is uh, get that somebody knows right. absolutely nothing about the game and learns the game right. from right. it. And uh, that's, that's something that I just did with the rule book I was working on. And that's, that helped me. And the funny thing is going back to the errata thing for a second, I got the final edits sent to me and I'm reading through it. And I'm like, damn it, I missed two words. <laughs> and they're kind of critical, so I'm going to have those added in. But I was like, I can't believe it. It just goes to show you, no matter what you do, you can have all the notes. And I had a file folder of all the things that I had done with, with proofing because I like to print I like counter sheets and, and all that other stuff to physically check because I'll, I'll write them off and I'll make notes next to them and stuff like that. And then I'll add those into a digital note yeah. on the project you know page so that way it's not lost. Or in my, one of my notebooks. Right. And it's just, um, it, it's time consuming, but it, it, to me, I feel better doing it and it makes me much more closer to the project and it, it eliminates errors, but there's still going to be errors. I don't right. care who you are. <laughs> it's, human, it's human nature. Yeah. It's like those stupid things you get on Facebook where there's like a whole, you know, a billion sixes and you got to find the nine. Yes. It's just human nature that you, you start, your mind starts adjusting to just see sixes, right? No matter yep. where you look, or what you know, whatever the little trick is. But I mean, sure. your mind is just conditioned that way. Yeah, yeah. it Absolutely. makes the correction subconsciously, and then you miss the error. Yeah, it's not the fact that there is a mistake; it's just how it's handled, right? So if they they rectify right. it, they actually acknowledge it and take steps to 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 improve it, fix it, second edition it, whatever they do. You know, mm -hmm. I'm good. I can understand that. I'm I'm not going to fault anyone for making a mistake. I mean, unless they've got a bucket of them that just like uh, uh, the very obvious difference between a mistake and like negligence, right? If it's obvious you didn't take the time to develop, right? Mm -hmm. Then that's more of a problem. Yeah. Right. So and that here's shows up more often in games that have scenarios or missions mm -hmm. uh, that you can say. You just there's no way you tested this thing. I mean, where where you just have one side massacring another uh, in turn four of a thirteen turn right. scenario. You go, there's no way, dude. I'm, I'm the first person to play this scenario. You know, you know, Mark. That's a that's a great point about, especially about war, uh, play testing war games as opposed to other types of games. Is that uh, most fearful sacrifice has what thirteen scenarios? So you need a team of guys, and I luckily I got luckily I got blessed to having Claude, Steven, Zeke, and Fred to work on this with me. But you need somebody to play test each of those scenarios multiple yes. times, not once or twice, because you because the, the game system by its nature is variable and chaotic. So you can't judge a scenario by one play or two plays or three plays. And that maybe is a big difference with war games, too. you know. Like Mark said, you know, if you, you've got 10 scenarios in these big games, it's a lot of work. You know, I've always wondered that about you guys. Like when you're uh, you're publishing an, uh, a very large game, right? Something that's grand strategic, that's going to cover multiple days, weeks, whatever the, the scenarios. I mean, you're talking Gettysburg, game. right? You know, yeah, right. The, the big monster game type. You want that play tested by more than just one person. So, and obviously besides yourself. So how are you doing it? How are you getting it out to enough people to, to really get it tested properly to make sure you've got the forces right? And the, well, I'll, the I'll tell you a, little dirty, a dirty little secret about a most fearful sacrifice is after the first couple of scenarios, I'm just designing the scenarios and sending them out to the play test team while I design the next scenario and they're play testing the last one. So I actually haven't even played a lot of the scenarios in the most fearful sacrifice. It's not physically possible for me. All I can do is spend the time to design them 
Well, Mark, why don't you send him a copy so he can finally play those scenarios? <laughs> no way. <laughs> no way. Right. Man, the dirty little secret is I don't play my own games after they're published. So, Have you oh. really never played your own game? No. Well, that's some shit. Why wouldn't you play yeah. your own game? Because I'm so burned out of the, the games one. after I'm done with them. I mean, Most Fearful Sacrifice was a year of hard work. Yeah, I mean, I, I get that to an extent, yeah. but that's kind of like not eating your own cooking. Yeah. yeah. I have a copy of everything. Herb and I are different on that, and we've actually been <laughs> taught. I, I, play, I play Long Road, 65 Solitaire. I played Live Resistance. I played it, played Live Resistance with Herb when we were at uh, Prescott. I yeah. play my own games all the time. I don't yep. go back and do stuff like lock and load or world of war because it's kind of pointless, but I play my own. I I don't know. I'm, I'm a bit of an egotist like that. I kind of like my own. Time. And <laughs> well, you're in the retirement portion. He, he's retired, but he's not retired from designing. You're, you're right. kind of, I don't want to say you're retired from designing, but you're publishing too. So that also lets you split your attention up a little bit more. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> He's not buying it. He's not buying it all. Okay. (laughs) Well, I tried. Well, one thing I want to do here is while we got everybody engaged in this conversation and and everyone's talking about it, it's so important to get blind play testing and all that stuff. Yeah. Everybody knows how to contact Mark at flyingpiggames.com, right? And you know how to reach out to Herm on Facebook. Well, I'd like to challenge, let's see, let's get four or five people here that will Put their name in the chat right now and say, I want to volunteer to blind play test or blind read or proofread your next project. Okay. So that way you guys can step up and get involved in the process. And you don't have to necessarily go in there and play 30 scenarios. You yeah. can play maybe a couple scenarios or just read the rules and the play rates because you'll be surprised that when you read and go, mm, that wording's a little awkward. Maybe you should change it to this. Right. That helps a designer immensely. And yeah. it helps a publisher immensely. So and by the even way, our emails like are not so large that we don't appreciate. I, I appreciate all the feedback. I yeah. really do. Yeah. No, I and I I'll can attest to that. All suggestions and all comments <laughs> and all criticisms too. Yeah. And I can attest to that because he sent me a copy of Volter's rules and I was just like, okay, here's some notes and sent it back. And you were like, damn, dude, I didn't even think of those things because <laughs> you had right. looked at it that many times. <laughs> yep. So I, actually, that's funny you should say that because when I was doing um, Miracle at Dunkirk, I wrote the original rules like five years ago or something like that. And I've, like you said, like with Walters, you know, you 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 pick up on some of your crutches and mm-hmm. you know your bad habits. And so as I'm going through it, I'm hacking off, you know, thens and all sorts of yeah. words that I, you know, too many words to be used in those in those rules. And that it's funny that you mentioned that. Yeah. Yeah. But you need somebody to tell you that. So yeah. you actually find that you use the same like wordage yep. too much in yep. your ro- Good God, that's yep. amazing. Because I find myself doing the same thing in videos, right? Yep. Uh, mm-hmm. Whatever the the phrase is. You got a verbal crutch of some kind, right? Yep. Too many ums or. I started replacing or... um with and then, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. And you know what everybody has with the the other big phrase that people instead of saying ums now they go. I'll start off and say saying when you ask them a question, go, um, they say, I mean, you yep. mean what? You're just starting your sentence. <laughs> but we use it all as we all use that term. Yeah. You know, start a sentence with so. Dude, I actually yeah. counted so. in one of my videos, and there was something like 32 or 35 now, because I found myself saying it at the beginning of every sentence. I was like, now, do 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 now, do 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 now. And I was yeah. like, oh my God, I, I'm driving right. myself insane just editing this video. <laughs> so I had to go back. It's hard to break it. Yeah. It's hard to break it because it just comes out. <laughs> well, thankfully, the editing, right? I can see the pause in my sentence. So I could go to the beginning and just chop, chop, cut chop, chop. Yeah. Yeah. And have to cut. I mean, I'm, uh, I, and fuck. Mo got me saying it now. I'm saying, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, it's real. No, no. Uh, you know, Jester saying I'd be more than willing to send it to my group of 116 guys. Well, Jester, you're number one at the top who's volunteering right. for the next project. Are you talking about tack up wargaming on Facebook there, Jester? Is he talking about his boyfriend? Friends? Oh. <laughs> I could have stopped picking on Jester. He's going to start taking it personally. I'm just picking at him. We we love you, Jester. I'm just, I'm just funning you, buddy. No, there isn't, Brian. Uh, It's in the, uh, all I can say is it's, it's on the list. 
Well, okay, where so are we? we uh, meandering Mike says in May he'll be available to do some play testing. So reach out to either or both of these two great gentlemen and uh, definitely awesome. help out. I, I would say I'd like to read some Plum Island rule book. So if you got that ready, definitely uh, you know, send it yeah, my it's way. It's interesting. Uh, GMT has a whole different system than the rest of the companies do. They yeah. are really that's a corporate, that's a corporate structure there. Uh, um, I've talked to Gene to a couple of times, but he doesn't really know who I am, so I can't exactly email him. <laughs> hey, what are you talking about? Carrier battles. Uh, so, I don't know. Carrier well, we battles. have Jester. He's going to volunteer. Meandering Mike's going to volunteer. By so the way, Jester, two. you're talking about guys who can read multiple. Jester is amazing. He does four videos a day of different games, and he just gets them and unboxes them a day or two before, and he's playing them right away. I don't know how he does it. I don't know either. I don't have the time for that. I wish I did. Mm. You know, it's like Florida oof. air. Does he have kids? <laughs> it energizes you. It's okay, so we're up to three now. <laughs> Stacking limit is going to join in as well. Awesome. So we've got three so far. So make sure you guys reach out because I will be checking up on you. We're taking right. notes. Yeah, we're going to have you on the naughtier or the nice mm-hmm. list. From yep. come the Christmas I want an email <laughs> from all 116 of uh, Jeffrey. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mo, list up uh, Mark's email address so they yes. got it just in case. Mark Walker at uh, flyingpigboss.com no. or something. But yeah, put Mark at flyingpiggames.com. Yeah, you were hard to find on Instagram, by the way. I was trying to tag I'm you. Flying- I'm big game boss. Yeah, the, I was like, "Where yeah. the hell is he? I can't find him." And it, yeah. didn't realize you had, uh, you know, Bis, bo, big boss hog as part of your uh, your title over there. <laughs> <laughs> so reach out, you know, and definitely, uh, there's always projects that are going on that uh, you even if all you can do is say, "I got a couple hours a week that I can I can dedicate to this," and give me a rule book, I can read it over the course of a couple nights. Yeah, believe me, just reading the rule book yes. is definitely worth it. Yeah. yeah, and I also have to say this: just because you email me, don't start trash talking me and Mo because I don't get back to you in five <laughs> minutes, or five days, or five weeks. When, there you go. When we need somebody, we will, and I really appreciate it. Absolutely, you know, and and get involved and help out because uh, it, it is our community, and it's uh, it is what we make of it as well. Uh, mm-hmm. It can't just be on the designers and publishers. Uh, we have to do our part too. And uh, we have a question here from Jester saying, "What does uh, what does Herman think is the most interesting way for a rulebook to be implemented?" <laughs> <laughs> implemented. <laughs> okay. Like, we know like, he's not a rulebook <laughs> editor. <laughs> implemented. How do you how do you think is the best interesting way for a rulebook? Jester, you need to proofread that. <laughs> That's a rata right there. Exactly. No such thing as a rata, though, according to him. <laughs> I don't see how you can have a rata in a in a post. Um, I don't. Well, I don't know that you can necessarily have any standard way of doing a rule book. Um, it really kind of depends on the game. I mean, I, I do appreciate the uh, <laughs> very nice. <laughs> like I said before, I mean, I. You know, rule books, uh, what is this? This is Astro Knights. You know, but it's got to be attractive to the eye, right? Look at that. It's colorful. It's got boxes. It's got highlights. Um, I think keeping the reader's interest is definitely a big plus, right? And like I said before, you got you to gotta follow everything with examples so that when people read a section, they said, all right, well, these are the supply rules. Jeez, how does that work in the game? And then you have an example right after that. Showing you, well, if you did this, 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 and this, this is how the fly rule works. Yeah. Um, other than that, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm not against the case system. I'm not necessarily for the case system. I, uh, some of my games, I use a, a variable case system, which is the main category is A or B or C, and then it's a one, and then it's uh, lowercase letters. I mean, I mean, there's variations of the case system. Um, Hex to hex to um, So I don't think there's any one answer to that. I think it depends on the game. I mean, obviously you can't do uh, Empire of the Sun with that kind of, uh, you know, heavily illustrated uh, rule book. 
right? Yeah. Um, it would be difficult, you well, know. I yeah. think when it comes to layout and the colors, my, yeah. my uh, rule of thumb is, would a Marine read this? Yeah. If, if, <laughs> if it's outlined in crayon, if you're damn right. And we'll look it up too. For a Marine. And if it is, I think I've got a winner. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if me and Gippy can read it, anybody can read it. We're, we're yeah, we're in the ballpark of easy. Actually, I'll yeah. say that uh, the long road was well written because it was streamlined enough. The text mm -hmm. was big enough. There was crap in there that uh, broke it up, so I didn't feel <laughs> there like there was it. crap in there. That's so I don't. Wait, I'm really <laughs> If I'm looking at the page and I feel oh, like I'm back in a college sauce class, is crap, right? <laughs> yeah, whatever, you know, nice picture of boobies in there, something to just take my mind off of things. I'm, I'm good, but uh, vampire boobies. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's uh, it's that fact that uh, it'll look like a college textbook. When it looks like a college textbook, I just zone out, and it's the hardest time just trying to yeah. to to keep right. going. The the small print and that double space, double right. paragraph on down, yeah. italicized, uh, whatever examples or that type, you know, that type of rule book. Those are yeah. the yeah. worst to try to get through. I'll give it marks aren't like that, right? Yeah. None of his yeah. games I can think of are along those lines. And I've That's always been point, able to GB, breeze that. It looks like a textbook. Yeah. <laughs> You're know, right. As opposed to something that's entertaining to read, like a comic, like yeah. a comic yeah. book, right? It's yeah. not uh, going to be. Marks, right, the way, the way you lay it out is definitely a key to that. Like I should be able to, uh, and not to be grody about it, but I should be able to go to the toilet, read it, and not f literally fall asleep in the middle because the book is that damn boring, right? And I right. have had rule books that have been so bad that I've just zoned out like that. Well, it also depends Correct. on the type of game and, and how it's laid out and how it works in the, how it can be laid out in the rules. What I've always done is similar to what Mark was talking about earlier. I'll grab the game, I'll throw it on the table, and I'll say, okay. Page one, set up. Boom, 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 boom. Right. All right. Step one. All right. Here's my player aid. Okay. Okay. Here's how I'm doing. I just go through the rules. Now, a lot of games, many games work that way. And I think that is a great way of judging a rule book right off the bat is like, can I get into it right away? Can I start making decisions right away? Is it easy to, is it easy to follow and understand? Right. But not all games do. A perfect okay. example of that is Next War. Next War series, you re you have to play it off of the player aid. Because the player aid is going to tell you the sequence of events, and then the rule book will tell you how to do each of those sequences of events, and it's not in exactly in, in the order that it's right. on in the uh, in the player aid because it's a different type of game, different layer of complexity, different just different you know mechanically. It's similar to most board games, but it just flows differently. But what we want and we like the most is the rules that you can just sit down and play right out of the rule book, which is what I think happens most of the time with Mark's games is they're like that. And so are yours, Herm. The, the games that you guys do are you can sit down with the rule book and play them right out of the rule book, which is great. And I think the, a good key to that, I think the key to that, what Mo was saying is that if you write them in the sequence of play, mm -hmm. which a lot of these, these games that I'm playing now are, I can just open the rule book. And like you just said, here's the setup. I'm right. setting up the yep. game. Here's the first thing you do. I'm doing that. Here's the yep. second thing you do. I'm doing that, right? Is that what you're going to say, Mark? No, yep. sir. Uh, no, no, that's cool. Um, I think a barometer, you know, Nate was saying jokingly, you know, can you go to the John and read it and not fall asleep? A barometer for me, uh, literally, can I take the rules to bed with me at night? Because I'm not one of those people that reads extensively before I go to sleep. But if I can take a rule book up there and, and read for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. it's a well-done rule book before okay. I go. Yeah. So, yeah, that's I'll, a good broken. That was a good point Nate had about it. I'll, mm -hmm. I'll definitely yeah. agree with that. For me, when I sit down with one, I do it a little different than Mo in the fact that I'll just take out the rule book itself and I push everything else to the side and I'll read the one time cover to cover, just eyeballing it. And then I read through it again, but this time I'm pulling out all the components. So now when I'm going through the rule book, I'm actually associating those things that I've already known about because so many times when you're reading a rule book, you're, you're reading it and it's talking about concepts you haven't got to yet. Right. Yeah. So right. there's no way they can impart all 60, 40, whatever pages 
into your head instantly. So I've got no frame of reference and I have no clue what they're talking about. I find it's right. easier for me to get that frame of reference. So now when I'm going through that second time, I'm okay. Now I understand this is what they're talking about with the supply lines. I see it here or okay. I see this here. This all makes sense. And I can associate it to something or what I've read previously. Yeah. I think that's a good, that's a great point. That if they're telling you a rule and you haven't been introduced to the general idea yeah. of the thing, it, it's just going to go right out of your head. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's what's killing yeah. me with carrier. And that's right where now. you can set up. Well, that, you can set up pieces of the game and then read the rules. And then again, like that's why I held up my notebook. Make notes to yourself as to what it is. So you make your own cheat sheet so that way you can build off of it. And then maybe even create your own play rate card like we were talking oh. about before. You know, Harden was saying how we did that to remember all the rules. It, hear me out on this, mm -hmm. right? Because I understand what you're saying and what you like about carrier. But my problem with it is it has it's doing both. Right. If it were just breaking mm -hmm. it up based on these first learning scenarios, that would be one thing. If it were breaking it up according to the sequence of play, that would be one thing. But it's trying to do it both ways. And it'll have things in the rule book that are sequential to what they're talking about now, but they're not referenced until later. So it's written down in section scenario three, <laughs> but it's not going to be used until scenario five. With that, now your rules are yeah, mixed yeah. up. It doesn't make any sense. If they, oh, yeah. that part was under Section 5, okay. If you just did it according to the timeline, okay. But you can't do it both ways because now I've got no frame of reference because that scenario, that learning scenario, doesn't have anything to do with the rule that you now have in that section because it technically, according to the time frame, belongs there. Does that make sense? It's kind of hard to describe if you haven't played mm -hmm. the game itself. Mm -hmm. But it, it, to me, it's not working right. because nothing's I right where it goes. Yeah. And Mo's, mm -hmm. Mo, are you flirting? There was what somewhere. are you doing here, buddy? No, no. I was, <laughs> I was going back through the, through the comments here. And this one was for um, Mark. They were talking about, uh, was there any talk about 85 tonight? So, yeah, we started off the show with that. Yeah. And we're down to... Um, uh, let's see, what was it again? It was uh, 18 hours. I just pulled it up, 18 hours to go. Mm -hmm. So if you haven't, I just posted the link in the chat. If you have not gone there, definitely go check it out. Uh, and and then there was- a link to that video we did too, if you wanted yes. to. Yes, And then there was uh, another one about 65. Is there gonna be plans for a reprint of 65? I'm trying to find there it. There are plans, so, there are plans. Best laid plans of mice and men? Yes. <laughs> there is the list. There is the list. And then that would man or Mike says, I would love for there to be a reprint of 65. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. There well, you go. I appreciate that. I, I enjoy it myself. I'd love to do 65 and Night of Man for a reprint. And Night of Man. And more for a reprint. Night of Man. I don't have Night of Man. Reprint that one. I've got 65. Yeah. Night of Man's great. Well, I can send you a copy of Night of Man. I will. I don't want to like you a copy. Well, that's kind of unfair because the people can't get it. <laughs> I, I okay. I feel bad for the others, but yes, well, go Herb ahead. Can play it with me anytime he wants to. <laughs> Mo, right. if you want a copy, I'll send you a copy too. Nice, nice. I thought well, you had Night of Man. It won't be in a. There won't be in a box. The, who cares? Yeah, I don't play box with the box. box. <laughs> okay. No, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. I appreciate it. So that. Ed says, I would love to see Night Man on a hex grid. Yeah, why? Why, uh, Ed? Why? <laughs> what to be difficult? Where's? <laughs> I'm not oh. sure. We'll have to wait and see what he says. The rule books that frustrate me are the ones that leave me more questions than answers. Don't happen uh, very often, but when it does, but when it does, yeah. it's frustrating. And that's right, true. Right. Like I said before, there are certain rule books you read them the first time through and you go, I got this. I yeah. totally understand it. And there's other, and I know there's, there were a couple of war game rule books back in the day. I remember reading one on the plane. And when I got off the plane, I was like, I have no idea how to play this game. This doesn't stick with you because of the way it's presented. Um, well, I'd say, I think for me, I'm, I'm a very tactile, tactile type of person. I like to do something first and then read about it after, which is why mm -hmm. I think I like to sit down with the rules 
and at least put some counters out there and, and play around and say, okay, how does the combat work? How does this go? Like, like what Nate was saying before was, okay, well, they're talking about supply and that's on page 30 and I'm on page eight. Right. Okay. I'll set things up. Okay. What is it? What does it say on the supply? Okay. If it's like this, yeah. okay. I'm not going to really run into that problem too often, you know, or if I do, I'll just know to hit 30, you know, uh, mm-hmm. and at that point, you know, you build off of it that way, but everybody learns differently. Some people can read cover to cover and understand a rule book, you know, say, oh yeah, now I get the game. I'm jealous of people like that. That would be Me so too. cool. Yeah, that um, would be nice. But unfortunately, you know, I'm not. And video is a great tool. Uh, and that's why I think uh, that is uh, a really uh, uh, an important thing that should be used more often. But hopefully in with accuracy, you know, as much accuracy as possible. Yeah. Uh, shooting for 100, getting 99%. <laughs> Uh-oh, what do you got now? Oh, 65, there you go. Yeah, you know, we're talking about it too much. I kind of wanted to play with it now. So, <laughs> The reason why he says he's, he has not played on squares since Tactics 2, it's just wrong. Well, no. that, I mean, that's, that's fair, <laughs> but... Well, it depends on the system. I mean, we use squares yeah. for a magnificent style in Pro Bar, right? Yeah. Tell me when that shows up. Is it <laughs> <laughs> I see a head. <laughs> How do I just it's the other is here's a Normandy. Oh, did you here's just Normandy. get that in? Never played Heroes of Normandy. I mean, that game was immensely popular and it uses squares. Yeah. yeah. Did you back the uh, the latest uh, Kickstarter they did? The what was it, Carantan or Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've got Heroes of Normandy. I've got Shadows over Normandy. Yeah, right over I've there. Got Desert uh Wraith, Wraith, Wrath, mm-hmm. and uh Heroes of Black Reach. Herman and I played Heroes of Blackreach. That's the 40 k Herman Con 2. I yeah. love nice. Heroes of Blackreach. I thought that was yep. criminally underrated. I it agree. Just, for a 40K I mean, game, I'm a huge 40K fan also. Yeah. I expected people Talking to be going about nuts rules for it. That confuse me, though. You know those boards that you built in, in any of those series of games? There's a board. That like you build your company, or maybe it's a platoon. I think they're squad. Do you, you know yeah. what I mean? That yeah, I yeah. I have a tough time understanding how to do that. It's oh, kind of like that, that the end was playing with yeah. me. You did too. We both were like puzzling. Yeah, we weren't it. sure if you could attach the other piece on the end or not. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I remember it had something to do with like setting their equipment or setting up yeah. a platoon or yeah, a leader and aids and stuff. Yeah. yeah. It's been yeah. a little while since I played it, so I'd have to pull it out and uh, yeah. and try it all over again. But I remember I liked it. I had They're a really good time with games. it. It's a fun game. Yeah. yeah. I can't wait yeah. till the Kickstarter comes in because I got the um, that and the, what was it, the big red one because I didn't have that one, right? Mm-hmm. So you could get, get like that. the whole package. Yeah. Right. Didn't they just do a Stalingrad one? Uh, yeah, they did Stalingrad, yeah. I think so. Yeah. By the they way, Mark, that. you've had 18 Kickstarters. 18? Huh? 18, wow. yes. You and big how boy. How many of my back? Yeah, Robert, oh, Robert Carroll says yes. On Heroes of Normandy. Let me. Uh, Let's see. Uh, um, more, well, 18 created, 138 backed. Because <laughs> I got your, I got the page for uh, uh, yeah. for it up right now, and it says uh, 18 created, 138 backed. Okay. Is your my games? There How you many go. of you backed, Herm? Uh, most fearful uh, sacrifice second edition <laughs> still waiting on that one he's never played it oh you know i mean that that's a great question i can answer that super specifically in a generalized way um, <laughs> the, that's a markism um, there <laughs> the final the, the the final proof that we get after they literally start running or have run the entire game is uh, they'll send me a copy, okay? I mean, it's the full up what everybody's going to get. And that particular copy is coming in on Friday. And so if there are no problems with that, and it's it, it can happen where we find problems. When they sent that copy of Crowbar, we found that somehow the Germans were green like the Americans. Remember that? I, I remember that. That was yeah. a major deal. But – 
if there are no problems with this, then uh, at that point, they'll finish everything up and it'll get on the ship and come over here. So if there are no problems with that. I would say two months from now, we would probably start shipping. It's so about summer. Hey, there's Mike. Oh, yes. what's up, Mike? FYI, Mark, just so you know, don't expect Heroes of Normandy too soon because evidently they're using that company that is uh, closing down. What is it? Fun again? Fun again. Oh, fun again. Yeah. Fun yeah. Again. Yep. So supposedly uh, Heroes of Can, uh, Con, Can, however it's pronounced, is yeah. one of the last ones Fun Again is going to be shipping out. Yeah. But I mean, when a company's closing down, that kind of worries me because now the employees have no incentive to not yeah, be right. dicks. So, well, but, they probably, you know, get that. They'll probably sort that out to other people too. But well, maybe you rename them the fun at some point. Yeah. That's it. We're Fun Again. Yeah. They're done. April. So the employees have no incentive to not do their jobs badly, throw stuff break stuff, steal stuff. And I'm not saying they will. I'm not like hating all well, their Well, what's your employees, recourse if there's a, an error? Yeah, they're that, not going to be right. fired, you know? So Well, really, this, you do have the same recourse that you would have even with the functioning company. The bottom line is that in, unless, the, unless the shipper does something obviously wrong, it's going to come back to the publisher to fix any problem. Yeah. Um, yeah, anyhow, that's it. But we use Quartermaster, and they're not even close to closing down. They're huge. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll tell you what, Quartermaster, I don't have a problem with Quartermaster, but they've made some interesting decisions here recently. Uh, like okay. the fact that they have accepted money directly from the, I can't even say yeah. customer because it's not their customer. But right. from the consumer to pay for the shipping costs because companies have gone out of business, right? And then others oh, haven't yeah. followed Who through. Was that? Who was that? There I was, that. Uh, was that? the Fantasy Series 1, Fantasy Series 2, whatever, the, the oh, series of minis. Yeah, I paid, I paid them to release that. Yep. Yep. They're supposed to be shipping those. Did you ever get that? Uh, yeah. It was the Sadler Brothers slash Black something. Yeah, Black Ace or Black whatever. I can't remember the name uh, of the company. Uh, yeah. But they but went right, out of we business. Had to pay, right. We had to pay Quartermaster to release the product. Yes. But there was something interesting, and I was telling Mo about this. There was another game called, um, it was by Grimlord Games, and it was the Ever Rain. And I backed that mm -hmm. game something like five years ago. Well, I started doing videos about them, about uh, Grimlord Games, about Quartermaster. I had emailed them for uh, an information. I told them I was doing a video mm -hmm. on it. I was like, I'm not going to slam you. I'm not. It's not a hit piece. I'm just yeah. curious. And of course, they gave me a very business-like answer if we can't say anything, blah, blah, blah. But what's funny is that they did the same thing that the Black Star, Black whoever did, about offering to let people pay to have their game sent. Mm -hmm. I was in the hospital when that happened. So I didn't get that email. I didn't see it. But they sent my game anyway. And as far as I know, I'm the only one that didn't pay to get my stuff shut. So I'm wondering wow. if it was a, well, let's just send him his to get him to shut up or not make the video, or I just got right. lucky and slipped through the cracks. I'm not Who's sure that? how it worked out, but Quartermaster now doing that really worries me because what companies now are going to see is that happening where Quartermaster is right. now taking money and they're going to know in the back of their head, well, we can close down or we can not say that shipping money and now these people will have to pay and quartermaster well, will do it uh, well but what would happen i mean yeah if you're going out of business you could do that yeah. but you couldn't do that and ever do another kickstarter no because the thing no. is is people will sit there i mean i know as a customer and i'm, I'm pretty good with this I, actually i'm very good with this if somebody pisses me off i'm just like i'm done you're on my perma ban yeah. list i will not do business with you again and, yeah. and that's it. You know, the American yeah. consumer has the power and they need to remember that. And uh, the customer. Oh, they remember it. Well, I mean, the customer needs to uh, I, I get several of those a year. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But, but the, <laughs> we, we don't do you for various reasons. Some of them justified, some of them not. Yeah, I was going to say, you don't do that sort of thing, though. Oh, I do yeah. the best I can with every single yeah. customer. But some people, you know. But if somebody's doing something that's knowingly living underhanded. Living in their mother's basement, it's not good enough. But I mean, if they're doing something that's knowingly underhanded, then that's totally oh, different. Never, yeah. never. Not only do I not do that, I'm never 
ever lie. Mm-hmm. That's horseshit. What what I lie about? No, I'm not. I'm not saying that <laughs> you're like lying wow. to me specifically. I'm saying everyone lies. Like you know, my wife asked me, "Do I look pretty in this outfit?" Yeah, hon, you look great. Yeah, beautiful. Love it. Well, <laughs> everybody lies. I don't know how your wife looked. What do you mean? If you get what I'm saying, the uh, I'm assuming you're married. Any guy that's married has lied constantly. Nobody that's tells the truth all the time. That if the wife isn't happy, no one's happy. That's that's a whole different. That's a whole different mm-hmm. bailiwick there. Uh, but um, yeah, I was going to say something. A- anyhow, yes, but you see, that's really not quartermaster's fault. What's happened mm-hmm. is, um, is that they've gotten this product in. And they can either destroy it or ask you for the money to ship it. Now, it, it's not fair. Uh, Mo is salty. Salty and we're up front. Up front. <laughs> what happened with up front? What is going on with that? Uh, nothing about it was up front. <laughs> <laughs> uh, up front was a disaster of a Kickstarter. Yeah. Real yeah. bad disaster. It was By one the way, of the worst. I mean, there have been a lot like that. Well, there, uh, you'd be- that's right. Yeah, blacklist. Blacklist. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So now there is, uh, like I said, eighteen hours to go on the Kickstarter for eighty-five. So get over there and check it out. There is uh, also on the channel we have, like we were just talking about here, or uh, actually Tim was talking about the uh, demo that Mark and I did for eighty-five was helpful. Really helps get the designer input during gameplay. So you can hear Mark talking about different yeah. things, different uh-huh. aspects of the game, and as as we played. Um, Wish there was more time that Mark had had, but he was really busy the past couple of weeks, and I was as well, where we could have gotten in and done like a little more of a, just a good ball, like a little firefight so you could see more action. Because this one, that that scenario we did was me running away, and, and I was like, man, this just goes, con- it's just contrary to everything that I want to do in a war game. I got to run. I want to go run into the fight, not away from it, you know? So, but it was, it was also interesting because then it gives you a different way of looking at, at the tactical problem in front of you. You know, how do I not get shot? And uh, if I can take a shot, I will. But, you know, you're also thinking points. You got to get a certain amount of troops across the board uh, past a certain point. He's got to keep you in line of sight. So there, there's a lot of little tactical nuance to it that I think it can could have gone either way. And when we got to that halfway point there, uh, which was really fun. Thanks. I really enjoyed doing it. And we will do it again. We will do it again. Uh, matter of fact, I'm working on kind of a smallish scenario now uh, nice. that's going to be one of the stretch goals, and we will. <laughs> Man, what happened with up front? Did they just not <laughs> deliver or what? A yeah. uh, yeah. real long story short, it, it turned into a, a copyright thing, a, a oh. scam thing. Yeah, it, There was a lot of back and forth. Uh, I There was multiple lawsuits, if I remember right. Uh, over it, but ultimately it did not get produced and a lot of people lost their money. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. And I think yeah. one guy did make off with the money, but I think he got caught. I was going to say, remember he ever, changed the name. with Steve Miller, take the money and run? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He uh, yeah. he changed the name of his company and then like launched something else, but was trying to say that they were two different things, right. but they right. weren't. It, it, the story's long. Look it up. It's It's a huge mess. Well, uh, Mike, I did a video uh, talking about some of it. Pretty easy. He stole our money to pay off his lawsuit. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Lawsuits, if I remember, it yeah. wasn't just one. People like that, they're a special place in hell for. <laughs> but <laughs> it was bad because you know, upfront was really? going to fund. It was like guaranteed money because it was so fondly remembered, and I think he sure. played off of that, right? That he knew that people would back to get upfront, so he used that to get. Yeah. money in his mm-hmm. pocket without yeah. ever intending to actually deliver that product. And then no one stepped up to actually deliver it like they did with uh, Evil Dead 2. I don't know if you guys remember that one. Kind then, of. Moved to, then it says here that he moved to Australia wondering if he ended up in oh. COVID camps over there. We would have served him right. But um, <laughs> <laughs> is that happened to a bunch of people? But, uh, people? So what were you, uh, you going to say, Mark? Just y'all remember that Jones I've got Park game? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. The huge. I've heard Billy Harder just about a thousand times. So there was 
big game, a lot of expansions on Kickstarter. And then to my understanding, the designer and the publisher uh, had a squabble. So the game was hugely popular, but uh, went out of print. And uh, I picked up a copy for $200 on Board Game Geek. Wow. It's wow. worth a thousand freaking dollars. Yeah. I can a billion, billion miniatures to it. Yeah. Yeah. I still have an, un, I still have an untrink wrap that probably never will. But, yeah. That's my, that's my one story of a Kickstarter gone bad that ended up making went good. good. Yeah. 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 By the way, if I could say one thing about Mark in 85 before we run out of time here. Uh, 85, 65, and World of War. One of the reasons I, I, I met Mark the first time was I was such a big fan of World of War because what he does with World of War and with 85 and 65 is he makes these games that are normally very complex, modern warfare and tactical mm -hmm. warfare, very playable and very fun to play. Yeah. So World of War, I thought, was one of the best systems I ever played back in, I don't know, when was that, Mark? Early 2000s or something? I don't remember. So, um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, and we'd do 2013, more that, or less. To me, that was the first modern warfare game that I played that I could actually say I could play it comfortably and not break a sweat plan and had a great time with it. And the same thing with 65 and tactical warfare. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, if you people want to play a game that has tactical nuance, but like, like Mo was saying before, but is really very accessible, Yeah, 85 and 65 is the way to go. Her Absolutely. You are the most gracious human in the world. You know that, right? It's very <laughs> nice of you to say those things. I always get too That's into true. talking games with you guys, and I don't pump my own stuff enough or our own, you know. The <laughs> well, that's what I was going to do before you started talking. I was going to say, so we're going to wrap it up here. Any last things you want to tell anybody about Flying Pig that you got coming up or you want to push or anything aside from 85? You can also talk about that as well. Well, her and I have agreed on the sequel to uh, Fearful Sacrifice. And it's going to be the Rock of Chickamauga. Chickamauga. Nice. I keep saying that's it. My, that's my research book on my table right now. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, actually, I'm going to be pretty busy the rest of this week with some, uh, anyhow, uh, some personal stuff. Nothing bad, just. Um, but uh, so I'll release the newsletter and the web page will be live early next week. We're uh, looking for a Kickstarter in the winter of this year. On Excellent. It, so, yeah. And then awesome. you also have a modern game, too, don't you, in the works? Do we have a modern game in the works? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so working on an expansion. I'm working or? on an expansion for the long road. Oh, another expansion. Yeah, introducing any new monsters or? Oh, it's a whole new bailiwick. Whole nice. New bailiwick. But it does it bring in, uh, for the non monster fans, it does bring in the British Army of the Rhine. Uh, and for the monster fans, this time there's no, there's no dancing around the paranormal stuff. They actually are doing an attack that goes right through a Soviet division that's part of the Soviet's paranormal wing of their army. Ooh. So they actively have all the forces on their side. So I'm very excited about it. And uh, yeah, it's in chaos. Yeah, I yeah, got to say the awesome. uh, the werewolves are kind of OP. I found that out in the, uh, I did a video werewolves playthrough awesome. of the, <laughs> the scenario, scenario seven, uh, if you remember yeah. that one. And no, it's got the three werewolves in it, right? It's got Ganari, whoever, uh, Gari, Guri, and then two standard werewolves. But the two standard werewolves with their armor, right? Their ability to resist one of the hits. Yeah, right. They resist the first hit, yeah. And the regen, they just mopped the Soviet forces. So it was the, the NATO forces, the Soviet forces, and then the, the werewolves in the middle. And the werewolves just pretty much took the Soviets off the board. And the NATO guys got lucky because in that scenario, they had the uh, vampire chick that comes on and she's pretty yeah, much the Katarina. only reason. Yeah. She's the reason that the, the NATO forces didn't get wiped because she comes in and then she saves them and fights off Gennari and took out what was left of the, the Soviet guys. Fun scenario. I had a blast with it. The only thing cool. 
I sucked ass. I, I, I felt so bad about this afterwards, but I could not keep it in my mind about remembering that that city in the middle was supposed to be forest. And I kept giving Ooh. them like the building saves, right? Mm-hmm. The building modifiers. Yeah. Not a huge deal at the end of the day, but. Yeah. yeah. I kind of hate doing that. I, you know, I, I remember that scenario. If I remember correctly, she comes on because Gunari, this is actually a scene out of one of the novels. Uh, wants to kill Hudson. He wants yes. to kill Hudson because Hudson and some, and this is another scenario kind of in the, in the game, Hudson and some guys murdered this, uh, murdered this wolf's family uh, when they, there was a battle at a farmhouse, which I kind of stole directly from Dog Soldiers. Dog Soldiers. Oh, dog Soldiers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so it was Katarina was just there to help Mike. <laughs> Katarina isn't pro NATO by any means. She, oh, she's pretty much not pro human. She she yeah. was though because it had that special rule. If you keep her stacked with Hudson, then she's controllable by NATO. Yep. So mm-hmm. I I immediately stacked her with Hudson and left her there, and she right. helped you know wipe the floor with the rest of them. But it actually worked out really well because the the wolves spawn randomly in that scenario. And okay. Ganari spawned literally right on top of the NATO forces, like right next to them. And the other two wolves spawned right next to the Soviet forces. So each side was having to battle the wolves. The NATO guys just got lucky because they had Katarina to come in after Hudson got beat up. So that the cool. that affected the scenario. Like I said, it's a lot of fun. Definitely. What like, you need uh, to do for the Kickstarter? Like you need to do a Kickstarter for that for the expansion that you're talking about. Well, I I am, I am, I am. And then in the in the Kickstarter, you do the books, and then you also have one of the stretch goals be an extra counter sheet of overlays, so that way people can punch them out and put them on top if they have any scenarios like that where they can have forest or whatever that yeah. just drop on top of the cities. So yeah. I, yeah. well, there's, there's a new. I can tell you in in the expansion, there is a brand new map. Matter of fact, it's at the office, or I can hold it up and show it to you. Two complete counter sheets. Nice. So there are um, there are the British units, there are some admin markers, and then there are the Soviet units. There are within this regiment there are loosely uh, it's regiment plus, but half of the regiment are just standard Soviet units. The other half it, it'll just be a surprise for now, but uh, I think it'll be fun. Nice, Carol, I'm looking forward to seeing. Definitely going to be cool. And uh, you to wrap up here, Herm, what do you got coming that you haven't well, already talked obviously about? obviously the Rock of Chickamauga. Mm-hmm. Um, the other big thing, we have uh, the Planet of Doom, uh, Fred's working on as the fourth in the Invaders series for Tiny Battle. Awesome. Uh, I'm working on a solitaire war game on the Battle of Waterloo for White Dog. And the big thing I got to start doing a little bit more seriously, but it'll get done, is the Blind Swords Napoleonic. For a nice. Nice. Going towards, people have been bugging me to go to other wars. <laughs> so we're going to do a Napoleonic uh, version of Blind Swords. Man, you nice. just... To wrap, up the, to wrap up the rules thing, one little dirty secret. If you have budding designers out there, you can keep your rule book a lot shorter by moving a lot of rules to cards. That's a trick I learned uh, a few games ago. Oh, yeah. More Fearful yeah. Sacrifice does it. Those oddball... You know, situations, stick them on a card, let the card bring the rule into the game. You don't have to stick it in the rule book, clog up the rule book. Use your cards to uh, to get more rules into the game without actually adding to the rule book. Well, that's, that's a great little piece of information to pass on to everybody here. And, you know, being that we were just talking about the long road and everything, we're going to sign out with the video that we had for the long road play that we did last time uh, we were time all out. together. Before yeah. we before we hop off, I wanted to shout out one set of guys. I've been talking okay. these guys up a little bit. Uh, they've got minis, resin ones. Uh, if I can. In country. Yes, in country. The, oh, nice. Go check out the video I did. It's called Where to Get Awesome Minis. Uh, these guys donate a percentage of their profits to uh, a veteran mm-hmm. suicide uh, charity, which I appreciate and big supporter of. So wanted to shout them out and make sure send more people their way. 
because uh, they deserve it. They do good work, and the minis are freaking awesome. If I could get them to show up with the green screens, kill me. What's, what's the name of the company? Uh, what is it? It's called it? Enemy Spotted Studios. Enemy Spotted Studios, yeah. Oh, okay. And their games are called In Country and Kill Wager. And you can mm-hmm. get uh, the files off of a website called My Mini Factory. Hmm. And uh, then, Nate, Nate's got a couple of videos up already, and I've got my yep. copy, Nate, is coming in on Friday with the whole smash. So I'm looking forward to that. Oh, cool. yeah. Yeah, definitely send me some pictures of that uh, oh, that well. bunker, that compound. That thing's going to be yeah. freaking awesome. Because he, he got the game and the minis. I got the game, the minis, the compound, the whole nine yards. So, I think oh, they right. upgraded me because I realized after I got the box in that I actually got the Kickstarter above the one that I ordered. So I think nice. it's like a, a thank you for doing the video to help promote them. They bumped it cool. up a, a step. I didn't notice it at first. So I was like, something's off here. And then I realized later, oh, they bumped it up. It was the one that came with the the board and the extra, the flat yeah, 2D re- pieces. Reach out to them and uh, and let them know because uh, they're vets. So yeah, but it's it's always good to let a brother vet know that we appreciate it. I keep making fun of them for being army guys. I hope they don't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody could be Marines. Yeah. You had something else you want to day in there, Mark? Did I? Um, no, I was just going to the enemy spotted studio place. And then I was going to ask Herm if he had a battle yet for the um, Napoleonic game. Yep. First game is going to be Leipzig. Nice. nice. We're going big right off the bat. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks everybody for tuning in tonight. Really appreciate it. And if you want to, if you did not see the video the first time, you can stick around and check it out now. We will see you guys on the next show. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Bye, y'all. The long road, an ounce of prevention. The unthinkable has begun. The impossible has been realized. A month into the war, and we were beginning to understand. Now the skeptics were the ones ridiculed. The naysayers pushed to the side. The unbelievers ignored. The lichens were real, not just slathering beasts, but rather a well-organized group of guerrilla clans with one objective, to throw all foreigners off of their sacred German soil. The zombies, well, maybe they were slathering beasts, but they were real nonetheless a constant threat to both NATO and Warsaw Pact alike. The big problem, however, was the Eagle Airy Vampire Coven. Vampires were fast, strong, brutal, and extremely intelligent. They were also well-organized and wealthy, as only a tribe with 400 years of accumulated wealth could be. They had put that wealth and intelligence to work in creating the most advanced weaponry on the planet. From Gauss rifle armed tanks to the world's first combat drones, the Eagle Airy Coven always seemed a step ahead. So when word got out that a gang of thugs had stumbled on plans for the Coven's Slayer tank after wiping out a vampire hide in the center of Luchtenreich, East Germany, it attracted a lot of attention. A lot of attention and a lot of guns.